Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to those of you who have ventured out and joined us on this soggy Tuesday morning. Thank you very much for being here, and for those who might be participating and listening in through the webcast, you might have picked a very wise way to join us here today. Um, and for those in the room, I would note that um, Commissioner Caputo is uh, on her way and will probably come breathlessly into the room momentarily, but had to address an unexpected uh, other matter this morning. So so she will join us in progress when she arrives. But the Commission convenes this morning uh, to hear an update on the status and issues associated with the path to licensing uh, what we've uh, all termed accident-tolerant fuel. Occasionally I hear it referred to as advanced technology fuel and other things that fit the same acronym, but for the purposes of our meeting, uh, we're talking about what's termed accident-tolerant fuel uh, for use in commercial nuclear power reactors. This is not a new topic. The agency staff has been uh, very involved with uh, operators and also with the um, fuel vendors for a number of years now on this topic, but the Commission viewed that since this is a very active area, it would be a good, a, a good meeting to have and just to check in to see how everything's going and, and um, what the efforts are and any issues that the Commission may, um, you know, need to weigh in on or bring to its own attention. We will hear from two panels this morning already seated at the table are the participants in our external panel. Following that, we will have a very brief break and then we will hear from the NRC staff after that short break. Um, with each panel, we will hold questions till the end and then um, we we will uh, hear questions from the commissioners for the panel. So with that, uh, we will begin with uh, our external panel. Um, but I will ask first if the colleagues who have made it to the room and, and aren't rushing up from the garage and elsewhere uh, have any remarks to make, <laughs> hearing none, uh, we will simply begin with the panel's presentation. So I intend to proceed in the um, order in which you all are listed on the public notice for the meeting that we've put out and you're seated. So I assume unless you've arrived at any other agreement amongst yourselves. We will begin uh, with our uh, interagency partner. We will begin with Mr. Andrew Griffith, who joins us from the Department of Energy Office of Nuclear Energy, where he serves as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Fuel Cycle and Supply Chain. Mr. Griffith, welcome, and please proceed. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioners, for having me here. Uh, this is a very important topic, and, and I think it's timely to check in with you all on, on our progress. Uh, so I'm going to speak uh, briefly um, on the history and background of the topic, uh, bring us all up to date, um, talk a little bit about our industry and other partners um, in which they will go into detail more on, on their portion of the presentation and then wrap up with a, a timeline and a brief recap. So this challenge really started um, with Fukushima However, there were some technologies that were being considered before that. Um, I, I think reflecting back, the uranium zircaloy fuel at the time um, had been optimized over decades of incremental improvements, and it was perform performing at a very, very high level. I think one of the things that the events at Fukushima showed us is that uh, perhaps we can do better um, in the extreme conditions. Um, and also, this was an opportunity to take a look at that technology and move forward. Um, fortunately, uh, with the 2012 appropriations, Congress agreed and they supported us uh, beginning this program. So the next slide uh, recaps. Um, one of the first things we did at the time is define what do we mean by accident-tolerant fuel. Now this is slide four. So um, looking at uh, the range of conditions that were experienced at Fukushima as well as other um, postulated conditions that could exist in light water reactors, uh, what types of things do we mean by um, the ability to uh, tolerate or um, survive, um, add coping time, et cetera, in these extreme type of events? And so this is how we defined it with improved kinetic reaction to kinetics with steam, improved fuel properties, improved cladding properties, and enhanced retention of fission products. Um, and there's more detail on the slide. 
Uh, these have pretty much held constant throughout the program so far, and they kind of remain the, the performance um, areas that we look for improvement as we proceed. Next slide, slide five. Uh, we've been fortunate in that we've partnered with a lot of really excellent organizations, excellent people, uh, from the fuel vendors to national laboratories, reactors, owners, operators, uh, universities, and our international colleagues. Without this collaborative uh, partnership, uh, I don't think we would be where we're at, we're, where we are making, I think, solid progress uh, in, in making uh, um, uh, a difference in advancing the technology for light water reactors. And of course, uh, we couldn't be where we're at without the constant uh, engagement with uh, independent regulatory oversight. Uh, the NRC staff has been excellent in asking excellent questions, engaging in areas uh, appropriate, and uh, I think making us all better. Next slide summarizes the uh, areas of focus for the three fuel vendors. Uh, clearly the evolutionary improvements that are now in play, um, the coated cladding with doped uh, pellets, uh, those, are, those are making good progress. Um, however, they're all pursuing uh, longer, longer range technologies that could play um, an even greater role in the future. Next slide. National laboratories, um, clearly the key contribution from the Department of Energy. Uh, we have a range of test facilities that are uh, helping this program progress, uh, not only creating long-term or steady state type of conditions for this technology, but also pushing them to the extremes of either temperature or uh, reactor dynamics uh, transients. Uh, the, the accident tolerant fuel program was the key driver for resuming operations of the uh, transient reactor test facility in Idaho National Laboratory. Um, and and uh, it will be playing an absolutely critical role as we go forward. Also important are the advancements we've made in post-radiation examination in examining these experiments when they've come out of the test reactors. Uh, the, the range of technologies that we now have in play um, help us not only understand the performance of the, the experiments that they're examining, but they also provide a significant amount of data that feeds into high performance computers that will enable us to predict the performance more accurately. Next slide, slides eight. So here's a range of contributions from our universities and our international partners. Clearly the universities uh, are able to contribute in early stage type of conceptual evaluation and development, um, but they also help educate and prepare the scientists and engineers in our universities for entering the workforce in the future. Uh, so we, we see this as a, a really double benefit to engage with the universities in this important technology. Clearly, nuclear energy um, is a global technology. Engagement with the international community is essential, especially if we're developing light water reactor, uh, advanced uh, light water reactor fuel. Uh, clearly, there's global implications and the, the clear potential for global deployment of this technology that, again, will contribute to the, the uh, better application of the technology around the world. And, and we've gotten a lot of benefit, I think, from the um, engagement of these international partners and their questioning why we're doing what we're doing and so forth. Slide number nine uh, is an overview of the, the schedule. Um, it, it starts at 2018, several years into the program. Um, NEI did a great job of capturing and summarizing um, the steps we're currently engaged in and uh, those steps remaining. Uh, the hatch experiments were pulled out earlier this month, uh, lead test assembly, and they, they're going to be, uh, I understand they'll be shipped to the Idaho National Laboratory at the end of this calendar year. Um, and that's just one example, I think, of the excellent teamwork between the industry partners, both the 
the fuel vendors, the utilities, um, and our national laboratories. Uh, clearly we have um, a ways to go before we get into batch reloads and full core reloads, but we're learning a lot as we go. Um, and and uh, uh, clearly NRC is playing a prominent role in, in the uh, schedule going forward, as you see. Uh, to wrap up, I'll, I'll be brief here. Um, I think we've got a, a really good team. It's making good progress. Um, I can't overemphasize the constructive nature of the NRC engagement along the way. They're asking really hard questions. Uh, clearly, we have to uh, meet the standards to go forward. Uh, I think we're making great progress, but, but clearly we have more work to do. Uh, Funding is always a challenge with federal government programs. Um, however, hopefully we can sustain uh, continued congressional support. Affecting the uh, inter integration of high burnup and enrichment fuels is gonna be a challenge. And then defining that final step of commercial deployment will be a challenge. Um, there's, a, there's a point which DOE has to let go and let industry take over, and um, I think everyone in the program recognizes that. So thank you. Look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Griffith. Next, we will hear from Mr. Pete Senna, who um, currently is the Executive Vice President and Chief Nuclear Officer for Southern Company. He also uh, is here, or predominantly here today, in his role as Executive Sponsor for the Industry Accident Tolerant Fuel Working Group. Pete, please proceed. All right, thank you. And good morning. And you know, we very much appreciate the opportunity to brief the Commission on the industry's development of accident tolerant fuel. An ATF really represents an innovative technology where cycle efficiency and safety are coupled together, and that these are not mutually exclusive concepts. Next slide, please. Now, this is an overview of the ATF Working Group, established in 2016, and you can see it's comprised of utilities, national labs, fuel vendors, and EPRI. And essential to the progress is the independent research being done by EPRI, and Neil Wilmhurst, uh, Wilmhurst will uh, provide a briefing next. There are two main task forces within the uh, Working Group. There is the External Affairs Task Force and the Fuel Licensing and Safety Benefits Task Force. Now, the External Affairs Task Force is essentially providing messaging to the external stakeholders, media, Congress, on the benefits of accident tolerant fuel, while the second task force is focused on the identification and resolution of generic issues for the development and deployment of accident tolerant fuel. And really, the biggest benefit, the generic benefit that we've identified by these efforts thus far, is the utilization of higher burnup and higher enrichment, which is really enabled by the safety enhancements of accident tolerant fuel. Our goal is to deploy batch reload quantities of ATF with increased enrichment by the mid 2020s. Next slide, please. You can see this is a little bit of a uh, uh, busy chart. But you know, there are essentially five different applications of accident tolerant uh, fuel uh, uh, test leads installed today uh, between Southern Company, Entergy, and Exelon with all three vendors, uh, all with various combinations of dope fuel pellets and coated cladding. The next major milestone will be the submittal of topical reports uh, later this year. NRC approval of the topical reports will pave the way for the industry to then submit the licensing documents to support the batch reloads. There is a path forward here, uh, but it's predicated not just upon the research and testing, but also upon the regulatory clarity, predictability, and stability. Now, we do appreciate that the NRC staff is working on potential transformative changes to the NRC's regulatory framework and culture and infrastructure so that the agency can be more agile in adopting to new and novel technologies such as accident tolerant fuel. And in particular, we do want to thank the staff for their work on issuing the coded cladding, coded cladding interim staff guidance. We believe that this ISG does provide the necessary guidance to the industry to assist in the development of the topical reports. But it's also equally critical that the staff stick to the guiding themes of the project plan that states that no confirmatory testing outside of the post-irradiated lab testing is needed. Per the uh, project plan, the NRC has adopted the position that near-term ATF actions can move forward using the exemption process. Should widespread adoption of these technologies become apparent, 
the longer-term strategy of rulemaking would be needed for a more predictable and stable licensing process. Historically, the fuel licensing process has been a 20-year evolution. Now, there have been considerable advances in modeling and simulation capabilities to allow for the safe, accurate, and timely review of the design specifications and testing, and thus allowing for the timely deployment of ATF within the next five years. Next slide, please. Now, you can see here the benefits <coughs> enabled by ATF can be grouped into the following broad categories whether it be enhanced fuel performance, improved coping times, enhanced fuel reliability, improved operational flexibility, improved fuel uh, cycle optimization. The improved safety margins of the ATF concepts would then allow for the increased burn-up and enrichment, and then thus reduce reload sizes, reduce spent fuel pool waste, and allow plants to cycle, to transition to a 24-month cycle. Next slide, please. Now, you can see here, uh, at our hatch plant, right, after two years of service, the lead test assemblies at Plant Hatch have now been removed, <laughs> and they will be shipped to uh, Oak Ridge, uh, not Idaho, uh, this coming fall. The uh, lead test assemblies from Plant Vogel will then also be removed uh, this fall. Several of the uh, uh, test assemblies will remain at uh, uh, Hatch for the next uh, operating cycle for additional irradiation. Uh, in, uh, in closing, to support the deployment of ATF in the mid-2020s, it will require a sustained, coordinated, and well-managed effort between the industry, NRC, and DOE. You know, I truly believe that we have an awesome opportunity in front of us, but only if we all embrace it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next on the panel, we will hear from Neil Wilmshurst, who is the Vice President and uh, of nuclear and the chief nuclear officer of the Electric Power Research Institute. Neil, welcome and please proceed. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, as Andrew said, this accident tolerant fuel effort really has its basis coming out of Fukushima and is really one of the longer term actions and one which is being engaged in globally, and certainly the work being done in the U.S. is being watched globally. And I can tell the, um, the Commission that EPRI is fully engaged globally in the accident tolerant fuel work, and we're certainly very engaged with IEA and OECD NEA in this work. Um, and as I was preparing for this, I read a paper that one of my one of the team who's actually in the room here today, wrote, and I thought it was appropriate to quote it. The ideal ATF will improve plant safety while also reducing plant operating costs. And that is really the context that I'm coming to this briefing with. And really consistent with what Pete and Andrew have both said, I think the progress to date shows that that objective about improving safety and reducing plant cost is very likely achievable through this ATF um, effort. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so the discussion today will give insights into where we are and what needs to be done to bring this effort to conclusion. As Pete just said, the near-term concepts are being tested for deployment in the mid-2020s. And this, to date, has been a substantial collaborative win between the DOE, the utilities, EPRI, NRC, the vendors, where tremendous, probably um, unprecedented in some ways, progress has been made in the time frames where we've come so far. So I really want to give credit where credit's due to everyone who's been involved in this. So the benefits. So we have run simulations, done studies and analysis to show that the concepts that are being deployed and that are being tested in some of Pete's plants will, will very likely have an increase in safety. Talking about increased coping time in a case of loss of cooling of maybe two, one to two to maybe three hours. And that at first sounds short, but in those situations, one, two, or three hours can make all the difference. Gives time to deploy flex equipment, give time to take um, um, compensatory actions. And we're showing from analysis a reduction in CDF over the order of 10 to 
with no um, additional actions and maybe an additional 10 to 15 with mitigating actions. So my message would be there is safety benefit in these early deployed technologies. Even though we may at first blush say one to two or three hours, that doesn't seem much. Other benefits we're seeing, increased operational safety margins by virtue of the fact of the materials being used. Potentially the fuel is more reliable due to greater debris resistance. And also the fuel is fund could be fundamentally stronger to support more flexible operating strategies. So those are what we're seeing already studying the concepts that are being tested. So next slide, please. But the challenge is deploying ATF um, will not be a low cost. The current fuel is accepted as safe and the widespread adoption of ATF will need an economic driver. To put it simply, if there's no market, there won't be a supply for it. So that really is the question which Pete teed up very well, is if we believe the safety benefits are there, what can be done to bring an economic driver to enable the safety benefits to be realized? So next slide, please. So we have done some studies working with our um, industry partners, looking at the impact of higher burn-up and higher enrichment, utilizing the benefits of the ATF design, which um, all indications are will be fundamentally stronger and more reliable um, when deployed. This shows the benefit of looking at enrichment above 5%, um, maybe as high, I believe the numbers were talking, fi um, up to um, five to maybe six, seven, eight percent. Better fuel light utilization, getting the fuel cycle costs down due to that improved reliability, reduces the reload cost, reduces the throughput of fuel assemblies, gives longer cycle lives, and there, there are hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of fuel cycle savings the industry could realize if the combination of high burn up and high enrichment with the ATF technology was deployed. So that is the opportunity I think we need to look at as a, as a group of people collaborating on this effort to see how we can bring high um, ATF fuels to um, fruition. So next slide please. And the ultimate thing that does, that deploys accident toilet fuel with the safety benefits and the economic benefits, which should support the sustainability of the current fleet. So next slide, please. So what has EPRI done? Pete referred to the research we've done to support the discussions. We've looked at those feasibility studies in accident tolerant fuel, produced reports on the effectiveness of the, cla of the coated clads and, and um, technologies like that. We've done economic analyses on the high burn up, high enrichment, and documented those, and we've hosted many technical workshops. So this work has really informed the discussion. And if we go to the next slide, please. Again, giving credit where credit's due, our work has informed the NRC staff and actually our work on coated clads supported the NRC staff guidance on coated clads, which gave regulatory confidence to the vendors and the utilities to move forward. So again, this work has been um, a very strong collaboration across all the stakeholders and is, shows all the hallmarks of being able to continue to actually move this de deployment further forward. So next slide, please. This is a slide we showed last time I had the pleasure to brief the Commission over the traditional means of studying, accident, of studying fuel and deploying fuel. It shows about 20 years to get the fuel out. And we, we were discussing last time I was here the benefits of a parallel path to actually work these um, ideas and concepts in parallel with the benefits of utilizing modeling and simulation technologies that are, are now uh, mature. 
the progress to date shows that that approach has worked. All the parties have collaborated together, and we've actually got to a position where accident tolerant fuel technology is close to deployment. The potential is there for this parallel path to work, working on high enrichment, high burn up. And I would um, urge us all to, to look at what we can do to work in a similar framework around high enrichment and high burn up. Next slide, please. And again, this is a slide I showed last time to show on one picture the what I'll call the early deployment fuel technologies and then the fact the later deployment fuel technologies. You'll see the later deployment fuel technologies which have greater safety benefits. The bars are red. Those are showing that the, te that the work and R&D and the gaps are greater in those technologies. There are big benefits from going to the later deployment technologies, but we should all remember that there's a lot more gaps to close, a lot more work to be done to get what I'll call the ultimate prize, which could be re realized from the, the later deployed um, options. And my final slide, please. So in, conclusion, in conclusion, the near-term ATF and high, en high enrichment, high burn-up has safety and economic benefits. We still have to all work together to actually do the research needed to enable that deployment. And the, um, the benefit of the longer term deployment of the, um, the more advanced technologies will need us to continue to work beyond the mid-2020 timeframe we've talked about to actually get the, um, the final prize of the, um, the bigger safety benefits. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. For the final presentation on this panel, the Commission will hear from Dr. Ed Lyman, who is the Director of Nuclear Power Safety for the Union of Concerned Scientists. Ed, welcome or welcome back. Please proceed. Good morning, and once again, uh, we appreciate the uh, opportunity to brief the Commission on, on this very important topic. Um, so may I have the uh, second slide, please? Um, yeah. So uh, we heard um, from the previous speakers about that um, accident tolerant fuel development is a, um, there are two potential uh, sides to it. One is improving safety and uh, increasing safety margins, and the other is improving reliability and economics for the industry. Uh, as um, Mr. Griffith pointed out, the original um, Consolidated Appropriations Act did only specified that this was enhancing for enhancing the safety of light water reactors. Uh, but the industry uh, has made it pretty clear that their priority, or uh, uh, to put it mildly, is improving their economic performance. And I provide the quote from Mr. Holtzman from NEI that said there is no safety imperative for why we're going to be implementing ATF. Um, so that uh, concerns me. Now. Um, the uh, Nuclear Energy Innovation Modernization Act, NEMA, has um, uh, redefined essentially congressional authorization for what accident tolerant fuel is so that it covers both. Um, but it's still unclear to us that they can be realized at least um, on, at the same level. And I do appreciate Mr. Senna saying they aren't mutually exclusive, and I hope that's true. Next slide, please. So we do believe the primary purpose and focus of ATF fuel is to increase reactor safety margins. And since the taxpayers have been um, funding uh, some of this work through the Department of Energy, we think that that's, um, uh, that's really the public's goal rather than enhancing the industry's bottom line. Um, and our concern, again, is, as I uh, discussed two years ago, is we're worried the NRC could undermine this goal if it undertakes measures that uh, try to uh, qualify and deploy this fuel too quickly before the uh, safety analysis has had a chance to catch up. Um, so if the licensing standards for enabling the program to go forward um, continue to um, take shortcuts, uh, we're concerned about that. If uh, batch loading is approved before uh, uh, obtaining and reviewing sufficient and representative safety data, uh, both under normal and accident conditions uh, has been performed. There could be risks. And if credit uh, for ATF for reducing safety margins in other areas for the economic benefit of the industry uh, is granted, 
uh, it could end up being a wash or even reducing safety. Next slide, please. So I won't reduce, uh, I won't, won't repeat these uh, numbers, which we um, also heard from uh, EPRI just now, um, but you could look at these in different ways. Uh, that These are actually, the safety benefits are fairly marginal so far in most cases, and I would read from an EPRI uh, document that was um, presented late last year. Uh, where it said, it is noted that at the time these analyses were performed, that was coping time studies, these results were considered surprising as industry expectations had been that ATF would be capable of extending these coping times by much larger amounts. So it, it, the, the benefits seem to be more modest than originally anticipated, and that's fine, but one should also recognize that maybe there isn't as urgent a driver to, to deploy them. Um, uh, in addition to the uh, uh, studies that have um, done analytical work, there are also um, issues associated with reduced safety or increased uncertainty in the performance of some of these materials. For instance, as the um, uh, interim staff guidance on coated fuel points out, um, if the um, cr uh, clad coatings are delaminated or if there are interactions between the clad and, and the uh, substrate, uh, those could in, those introduce new mechanisms uh, of concern. And also, if you're looking at more advanced fuels other than uranium oxide, there's a breakaway oxidation of the silicides and nitrides, which is the reason why Framatum uh, is not pursuing uh, alternatives to uranium oxide fuel. They're only looking at new claddings in their own program. Next slide, please. So um, the, the economic benefits to industry, I think, were, still seem unclear. Um, it seems like there's been a bait and switch since this process started that originally the motivation was a greater safety and now it's trying to uh, increase enrichment burn-up um, for economic benefit. Again, that's okay, but there has to be a documented safety case for that. And it's not clear, looking at the numbers, um, that NEI has uh, generated that uh, the, the actual benefits are going to be that significant on a per reactor basis. Um, um, we also are concerned that the safety criteria may have to be changed to enable uh, some of these um, features to be credited. And um, in addition to the what I pointed out on the slide um, uh, that EPRI has said, uh, uh, you may have to go to a cladding strength criterion uh, to evaluate certain accidents instead of um, the current uh, minimum uh, departure from nuclear boiling because otherwise the benefits of ATF wouldn't show up in the regulatory analysis. NEI has also pointed out that to get the full benefit of higher enrichment and higher burnup, uh, they may need more aggressive uh, changes to design limits uh, to obtain that full benefit including peaking factors, moderator temperature coefficient, shutdown margin uh, as one. So um, again, we are concerned that, um, that the focus has to be on increasing safety margin. That's what the public and taxpayers um, have paid for, and that the, any economic benefits to the industry should be secondary. Next slide, please. So in that context, what is the rush? Um, uh, we think the timetable for batch loading of ATF by 2023 is unrealistic and may compromise safety. Uh, the, the lack of any real specific and standardized testing requirements um, raises questions. Um, traditionally, you would want to have uh, at least uh, some LTAs in representative conditions in a reactor uh, for the full uh, uh, campaign, the full number of cycles and burn up that you are planning the batch loading for. In this case, there's going to be an overlap uh, between batch loading and LTA radiation. And again, that could be okay, but it would put the NRC in a difficult position if, it, um, if data suggested that the industry uh, would have to uh, pull the batch. Uh, um, because it, uh, the data did not support safe irradiation for another cycle. And the, the industry, of course, would have to pay um, or provide for alternative fuel for that cycle. That's the, ri the risks on the industry, but the NRC should be wary of that. And again, uh, we think there should be pretty well-defined standards for 
um, uh, representative fuel radiation to the um, burn-up and also at the enrichment that um, would be used for the bash campaign. And that, so that, that a fairly long process, as we know, um, uh, could take um, more than just the few years that we've already um, had for LTA radiation and, and, and PIE. And then there's the issue of transient and loca testing. And uh, no one has mentioned the fact that the Holden reactor shut down uh, really uh, disrupted the original timetable for LTA development, except the schedules haven't seemed to change, and it's not clear that capability uh, will be uh, adequately compensated for. Next slide, please. Um, so so um, there are a couple of things the industry is also pushing the NRC to do. The staff uh, did not agree to do them in, in uh, in revising its interim staff guidance on the coded fuel, and we uh, support the staff on those. Um, uh, we think that the, uh, the fuel integrity uh, needs to remain a, a fundamental safety uh, objective, and also that the NRC certainly uh, should have the opportunity to review manufacturing parameters for coded fuels because of the uh, the potential sensitivity of the fuel performance to the way the coating is applied. So we, we think that's perfectly reasonable. Next slide, please. Um, uh, I brought this up two years ago. Um, the uh, commission still has before it the 5046C uh, uh, draft rule, and it would seem that approving that rule would help to clarify the, um, and, and in fact, enable uh, the ATF vendors to get the credit for the main benefit of, um, for instance, the coated cladding, which be, would be to reduce uh, 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 oxidation and hydriding at, at uh, high burnup. So uh, this would provide a, a structured process <laughs> instead of having to go to exemptions for evaluating this fuel, and we would urge you again to um, approve that rulemaking in a timely fashion. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, UCS was disappointed that the NRC staff followed through with issuing its uh, LTA reinterpretation that um, uh, allowed for LTAs to be used um, or to be deployed without necessarily seeking a, a review and approval from the NRC or applying for an exemption. We, um, there are a number of staff who objected uh, to that reinterpretation, and we um, stand by those comments. Um, so we believe that licensing approaches for anything, but also for accident tolerant fuel, should maximize opportunities for public input, and that means favoring rulemakings and license amendment requests and uh, formal topical report reviews instead of more informal processes or things that the public uh, does not have any opportunity to um, actually uh, p participate in with regards to the licensing process. And with that, I'll stop, and I apologize again for exceeding my time. Thank you very much, Dr. Lyman, and thank you to all the panelists for their presentations. We will begin uh, the questions today with Commissioner Caputo. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. Uh, Mr. Senna, the scope of work needed to support the industry's goal of batch loading in 2023 is substantial. What activities do you think have the potential to delay achieving that goal? Well, to me, we have the testing regimen already established. We have alignment between the industry and the staff on the ISG topical reports. To me, it's the predictability of the regulatory process. So I think the technology is there. It's really about can we jump through all the hurdles, all right, and not just on the regulatory process, but on the fuel manufacturing too. There needs to be that certainty from the fuel manufacturers that they have customers. For the customers to be there, we need to see the regulatory process with predictability. So is that a matter of making sure that there's a timely review of the topical reports so the industry can file license amendments to Correct. allow batch loading? Correct, because we're looking at 2025. <clears throat> So there's a little bit of a chicken and egg there with you folks filing license amendments on the utility side and fuel vendors making investments to Correct. proceed. Okay. 
And how long do you expect to, or have we said how long we anticipate review of those license amendments to take? John, I'll give that to you. What's the timeline? 12 to 24 months on the topicals. Okay. Okay, I'm trying to think through. I know there's a timeline for... Um, so if we're looking at topicals by the end of 2020, right. then review completion at the latest, the end of 2023, which then allows for the license amendments. But fuel cycle facilities will need to be filing amendments to That's, modify yes. their plants prior to that. That's correct. There are, this is not an easy process, you know, to be clear, and it is just, it is multifaceted. And the more predictability we have, in the regulatory process, I think the more predictability we can have between the licensees and the fuel vendors. Okay. Yeah, so I, obviously, I would, like, I would like to say it's you know A plus B equals C, but it is just it's. I think this is more of a, it's more of calculus. And obviously, this becomes with topical reports being one of the first <clears throat> points. It's incredibly important that the vendors are turning in high quality. And that's on us. Reports. Correct. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wilmhurst, do you, from what you know of our research efforts here at the NRC, do you, for near-term ATF technologies, do you believe our research efforts are sufficient and proceeding at a pace to support these licensing reviews with the goal of batch loading in 2023? I don't have the up-close um, information. I'm going to call Al Santos, please, if you're in the room, Al, to answer that. With the... I'm sorry, could you introduce oh, yourself and Al your organization? Al Santos, EPRI. Uh, okay. And uh, so the answer is uh, yes, uh, with caveats, uh, just to watch what's being done with the project plan that NRC has created. And we looked at that, we reviewed it, everybody in the industry, as well as EPRI, and uh, also with the ISG, we feel confident that we have a path forward here. But it's just what happens downstream as more information comes in, are there new items that come up? But yes, we are aligned. Mr. Griffith and um, perhaps Mr. Sana, but I'll start with Mr. Griffith. So you listed a number of test and examination facilities available at National Labs. I know Mr. Sana mentioned that the first LTAs are out of hatch. Uh, as far as the rest of the LTAs go, where and when do you anticipate doing the test and examination of those lead test assemblies? Right. Well, while uh, uh Mr. Senna corrected me in saying that the first one was going to Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Idaho. Idaho. Um, the long-term plan does include our facilities at Idaho. Uh, we have uh, compliance challenges that we need to address there that should be addressed um, by the end of this calendar year or early into the next calendar year. Um, what do you mean compliance challenges? So there is a, a facility uh, integrated waste treatment unit that needs to process um, a certain amount of waste before we are allowed to bring in spent nuclear fuel into the Idaho, Idaho site as part of our compliance agreement okay. um, with them. Uh, once that is uh, satisfied, we will have an opportunity to bring uh, a, a range of other um, uh, follow-on experiments or lead test assemblies into Idaho for post-radiation examination. Okay, um, as a follow-on question, my recollection is there were challenges associated with getting lead test assemblies shipped to the plants because of lack of canisters. Now we're gonna be talking about canisters that are shipping irradiated lead test assemblies. Do we have canisters available, certified for this? There, there are truck qualified shipping containers that are available. It's a yeah. matter of lining up the schedules. Yeah, we don't see an issue in shipping con uh, any of the uh, test assemblies uh, for the first one going out from hatch this coming fall. Okay, so we have approved shipping containers <coughs> for radiated. That is correct. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sana, 
Dr. Lyman stated in his slides that NEI has requested the NRC weaken deterministic standards for ensuring fuel and cladding integrity. I believe this is a reflection on a public meeting that was held at one point. Uh, would you please provide some additional clarity regarding well, NEI's comment that he might be referring to? Certainly, and if I can just, yeah, just provide some color. Um, yeah, I, I grew up in Long Island, um, and I was within 10 miles of the Shoreham EPZ, Wading River uh, School District. So in the 70s, I recall all the angst about Shoreham being licensed, and in the end, Loco lost the public trust of Suffolk County. And to me, that was the death knell of that plant. And yeah, as I operate Vogel, Farley, and Hatch, you know, I look at those as my plants, my people, my local community. And I'm not going to put my plant, my people, my local communities in jeopardy in Augusta, Georgia, Vidalia, Georgia, or Delta, Alabama. So we, the industry, are not advocating regulatory shortcuts or weakening of standards. We're looking for regulatory predictability and efficiency. This is not the 1970s. Okay. Uh, one last quick question for Mr. Wilmshurst, just a little bit of a clarification. You mentioned flexible operation and operation flexibility. What exactly is that a reference to? And Mr. Sun of China, if you choose to, I'm, I'm guessing maybe load following. Are there other aspects, though? That's really, that's really it, load following and some of the transients that may be um, predicted at the fuel um, could be more... Um, more sustainable with, in, with the increased um, strength of the new clad material. So it's really with reference to the flexible operation, yeah. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next we'll hear from Commissioner Wright. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, thank you all for being here today. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago I was in Knoxville at the, um, the Advanced Reactor Summit and uh, it's quite impressive. There's a great collaboration going on. There's a lot of uh, people, uh, government, you know, academia. They were all there uh, and fully participating. So that was that was good to see. Um, uh, and since you are our guest from another agency, Mr. Griffith, I'm going to start with you. Um, it's my understanding. Uh, uh, is that DOE is also supporting the deployment of high assay LE fuel for advanced reactors. How, if at all, um, uh, do the two efforts, ours and yours, um, inform each other? And can you provide me maybe some examples of where the two uh, intersect or overlap? That's a, a good question. I think there's a, a lot of synergy between the two programs, um, especially uh, with our potential for deploying uh, advanced reactors into the future for with high assay, uh, low enriched uranium. Um, in the near term, the accident tolerant fuel provides an opportunity to uh, touch all those uh, regulatory, technical, um, logistical steps for considering uh, greater than 5 percent enrichment, uh, both in fresh fuel and in spent fuel, transportation, um, and the, the fuel uh, supply chain, if you will. Um, so I, I know the, the one enrichment uh, operation in the U.S. that's um, operating, that they have plans, if they, I believe they've already engaged with NRC formally to uh, increase uh, their enrichment uh, capability there in order to meet the expected demand for accident tolerant fuel. Um, beyond that, it gets into the uh, closer to 19.75 percent enrichment for the future. And so um, I think in the near term, exercising the process will pave the way for addressing the, the longer term. Yeah. So um, thank you for that. Uh, it, it was recently announced also that uh, DOE's Office of Nuclear Energy was funding a collaboration between Framatome and uh, General Atomics to develop uh, nuclear reactor channel boxes for BWRs. Um, uh, using the silicone carbide composite. So given that uh, this technology was originally developed for advanced reactors uh, but is being applied for fuel design for the current fleet, um, do you see other future opportunities for your office to get involved in funding uh, and development in this area? 
Um, I do. Um, I think both the, from the fuel perspective as well as the structural aspects of extending the, um, the lifetime of the existing fleet uh, presents a, a range of opportunities. Thank you. Mr. Senna, how are you this morning? So you're the one licensee at the table. Um, and I'm curious about your view on um, other potential licensing impacts that the, the panel hasn't discussed. Um, the staff identified in its draft fuel burn-up and enrichment extension preparation strategy that there could be an impact on the staff's uh, environmental review, specifically with continued use of the generic basis presented in the uh, the guys for license renewal. So have you engaged the staff on what those impacts might be? And I guess if so, can you share how that might factor into your decision making going forward for deploying? Yeah, I'm going to have to, John, let me sure. defer to, sure. John, John Williams is my uh, director of nuclear fuels. Let me just defer to John. Hey, good morning. My name is John Williams. I'm the director of nuclear fuel and analysis at Southern Company. So, yeah, we have engaged the staff and we had a public meeting about the, the generic exemption. And I think right now the industry and the staff are aligned that that, that can continue forward. And we're uh, in dialogue with, you know, we'd be open to any conversation with the regulator if, if that, that changes. But at this time, we believe it's appropriate. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so, also, Mr. Senator, one of the things that we've uh, heard from NEI. Uh, before is that there should be a larger role in modeling and um, simulation. Um, so we'll, and I know we're going to hear more in the second panel about this too, um, on their approach. Can you share maybe how the industry is using modeling and simulation to expedite the licensing process and what efficiencies, if any, uh, have been gained? And again, I'll have to defer to John, my nuclear engineer. So really the intent of the modeling and simulation is to inform our test. As you know, we're working on an accelerated timeline, and therefore it's, it's going to be critical that the tests that we perform uh, get us the, the answers that we need. And so the, the purpose of the modeling and simulation is really to, to give us the uh, where, where do we need testing and, and make sure that that's very informed and very focused. All right. Thank you. Coming again. <laughs> Don't sit down. No. <laughs> um, so uh, Southern Company has been on the leading edge as far as accident taller fuel um, with hatch installing ironclad and armor lead test rods. So uh, and Vogel two installing the world's first complete. So I have a couple of questions concerning that. Have you, uh, having been the first and involved in this process the longest, are there any insights uh, you would share for future licensees? See, I told you. I told you. <laughs> um, I think you know we we are encouraging our our peer utilities to to pursue ATF. I think that uh, some of the things we've learned being first, uh, you know, we did have some shipping concerns with with the hatch LTAs. Um, and so I think the learnings that we have had is to, um, one, engage with the staff early and often make sure they are aware of uh, what you're pursuing um, and, and what your plans are so that, that we can both be aware of the concerns and address those uh, in a timely fashion. Okay, don't go anywhere. You might need you again. Um, so the last question that I have um, would be that um, for you is at, at whether the NRC's clarifying guidance on lead test assembly, uh, which was issued last year, uh, increased predictability on the licensing process, and are there areas where maybe further clarification would be helpful? Sure. Yes, sure. <laughs> You're doing well. Happy to help, Pete. Um, so, uh, yeah, we do believe that did provide the clarity um, that was very helpful um, for the LTAs. Um, with respect to other licensing areas where there would be uh, helpful, if rulemaking around 5068, if, if that were to proceed and were initiated by the staff, that would be very, very helpful because we do see that as a, as a challenge for us. Okay. Thank you. You did a good job. It's, <laughs> I hired the right people. <laughs> Mr. Wilmhurst, with the time I have left here, um, my final question was, is going to be, it's, so my, my, my understanding is that EPRI is, has developed a series of reports, you know, that highlight the safety benefits of ATF. So uh, 
today I think you implied that um, EPRI has also considered maybe the economic cost of ATF. Um, so this question has maybe three parts to it. Um, has EPRI also considered the potential downsides of ATF other than perhaps cost? Um, and if so, do you plan to issue reports on the topics um, or revise existing reports? And then uh, the last part of that would be, um, and are there any downsides that would affect the NRC's review of ATF? Very good questions, which I'm going to refer to Mr. Santos, please. So, Al, if you could go to the podium, please. Uh, Al Santos, Epri. Uh, yes, there are some downsides. Uh, Neutronics penalty is one of them, which is a it, it, it can be a, a cost inhibitor uh, to uh, to adoption. Okay, um, and as research and your second part of your question, as research evolves, as we get more information from the LTAs and other things, you know things may pop up that we may need to go follow up with. So that's kind of what I was saying earlier is that as we follow up with these PI examination, post radiation examinations. Uh, other data collection efforts that we get from uh, lead test or assembly, uh, you know, testing, there may be things that we have to go and follow up. And that's just something that typically happens with sure. product development. Thank you very much. I'm yield back. Thank you very much. Um, I have a few questions for the panel. Perhaps I'll begin with you, Mr. Griffith, although other panelists may have a view on this. I had a note here about Halden. Of course, Dr. Lyman mentioned it specifically, but the, um, I think many of us expected Halden to be operating for a number of years. Um, it is only one uh, part of the infrastructure that supports this type of work, um, and I know that DOE is uh, seeking Congress's support for the versatile test reactor and, and other items in their budget uh, so that there is at least some requested effort to enhance the R&D infrastructure in the United States to do this type of, of work. Can you talk at all about kind of some of the atrophy over the last 10 or 15 years in the um, laboratory and R&D infrastructure for doing nuclear work of this kind and how you see Halden's uh, closure kind of playing into that and then maybe measures that the national labs and DOE have on the horizon to, uh, to address it. Do you still think that, that getting to batch loads in 2023, I think, is possible with Halden's demise? Um, we're, yes, I think it is. Um, we are working uh, to incorporate some of those test capabilities that were lost when Halden shut down uh, into our programs in the Department of Energy, uh, specifically transient testing uh, for at the TREAT facility um, is in the works. Uh, there is key testing capability that uh, we need to uh, use the advanced test reactor for, which will require some um, adjustments to uh, that reactor during a critical phase in its uh, uh, maintenance cycle, if you will. Uh, in 2021, we have a core internals change out scheduled, which is just a routine replacement of the structural components in the advanced test reactor that receive high dose over its lifetime, those components are replaced. Um, and that pre presents a window for us to uh, incorporate some uh, important test capabilities that would uh, replace the Halden capabilities, if you will. Um, and the key component there is the top head plate on the, the pressure head, um, which will enable some uh, uh, experiment, uh, uh, experimental loop to be incorporated in its uh, capabilities. So um, we're working hard to incorporate that. Uh, the advanced test reactor is an absolute vital capability that the Navy reply, relies on. Um, and so we are uh, doing appropriate diligence to make sure those capabilities don't interfere or uh, impact the, the Navy uh, data collection process. Well, thank you for that, and I know, um, obviously, from my time in Idaho that ATR has been an absolute workhorse for the United States for a long a period of time, um, but uh, there is important other national security work to be done there, so which cannot be displaced. So thank you for, for that, and I know that those efforts uh, could probably consume their own meeting, and it's, it's a substantial ongoing focus for DOE and for the entire nuclear enterprise. 
Um, on Neil's slides don't appear to be numbered, but he had this uh, slide he had presented previously, and it has kind of the old model and the new model, and the old model took 20 years. But um, I know ever since Secretary Rumsfeld used the phrase, it's kind of a, a overused, but the unknown unknowns. But, you know, what you got in that old system took a long time, but you had a lot of data and testing that you did, and you had a lot of knowledge before you, excuse my language, potentially fouled up, you know, a really expensive asset like a, a power reactor with something that, you know, could have unknown unknowns. It, it, Ed was kind enough not to use that phrase, but the, the other behavioral degradation that could possibly emerge, I mean, it's a, it's a big thing to, to foul up a reactor. Uh, again, those are not uh, insignificant assets. So, um, I guess my question is, you know, knowing that it, I'll, I'll pick on Pete, though those are your assets, you've talked about them, and, you know, you view them as yours, so you don't want to put something in there that, that you're not sure about. How, how are you balancing those uncertainties as, as an industry operator? Well, it's, it comes down to it, they are billion-dollar assets, so that's why we're asking, you know, not just from EPRI and research, but from the regulator, you know, strong reviews. Right? And so it's, it's a yeah, but we won't yeah. know the unknown yeah. unknowns so, but, either. But, right. so. so, yeah. So how much do you need to know? And it's all about the modeling, the capabilities that we have today. Are they sufficient? Well, what's the level of reasonable assurance that we all need uh, together? You need it. I need it. Uh, and so collectively, it's it, it is a very good question. I can't give you a generic answer that this is good enough. So we have to be sure. And, and that goes back to, you know, the industry will not advocate, you know, any type of regulatory uh, shortcuts. But again, what do we know today from the lessons learned from the 70s, from that 20-year process, on what can we apply today? Just because we did it in the past doesn't make it right for the future either. Well, and as your presentation and others acknowledge, though, and I, I call it kind of the continuum of exotic. You know, there are, for in, in, in accident tolerant fuels, there are things that push the boundary of our current knowledge and experience mm -hmm. less than other things. And the other things, as some of your presentations seem to indicate, some of the more exotic things on the higher end of the exotic continuum in theory, based on kind of computations and calculations, may actually yield you, you know, the, the increased robustness slash kind of safety margin slash enhanced coping times and things like that, but also might help you with your, your economics. So I, um, you know, that's an unknown unknown for our staff, and I guess I just want to put that out there so it's appreciated the difficulty. It's not just resistance for regulators. It is, okay, we used to be able to have access to this amount of data. And I, I take the argument, first of all, that something shouldn't take 20 years. I mean, I'm not crazy. But, but second of all, that... That doesn't mean we needed all that. It just means that we're accustomed to having all of that and the certainty or enhanced certainty that that can create for us. So our difficult thing is we've got to navigate how much of that might be extra and might not be needed. So we just, you know, appreciate that it isn't just a, a failure to, to want to be open to new things. It's complicated yeah. for regulators, just like it's complicated for you not wanting to foul up mm -hmm. a really, really expensive machine. So together, we've got to navigate that, and it sounds like we are having the right discussions. I think there's also this philosophical undercurrent, while interesting, I don't know that I should take a lot of our time with it, but, but this program, as I think every panelist recognized, had its origins in Fukushima, but something can have its catalyst in something like that, but that doesn't mean that as it moves forward, it becomes still centrally about having fuel that is more robust and, and safer. And let me be clear, you know, my view is if the regulator views the current fuel as safe, which we obviously do because it's being used at reactors across the country, if we're not going to mandate something, then a whole set of other inducements have to come into play. It has to be, you know, something that, that demonstrates its value in the marketplace. I guess a curious philosophical question is, if you could have this enhanced fuel of enhanced safety, which is such an, a hard thing for me to say as an engineer because it's 
is not really defined, but if it were more robust and gave you the increased coping times and it costs the same as the fuel you had now, this is completely theoretical, mm -hmm. I assume you would do it because it would be better fuel if it had enhanced coping times and was safer. So, so. I do think that there's some peril in it keeping to talking about this as it has to improve economics. I mean, if the truth is, if it were the same cost and it allowed you the increased coping times, I think you would still purchase it. I guess I shouldn't answer for you. No, well, that goes back to just the operating philosophy of the U.S. nuclear reactor fleet. You know, so if there's always opportunity to improve safety margins, we do it. Yeah, and that's if we have an opportunity to deploy the accident tolerant fuel uh, just to improve safety margin, but at no increased cost, we would do it. As a regulated utility, I have a prudency review with with my public utility commission, and so I would have to present to them. Yeah, you know, and it, again, yeah, it, I mean, if just, we don't mandate it, then right. it has to be something that you freely elect to do. I will say, though, that it would seem to me just on basic kind of thermal and radiological phenomenology for materials, I'm not a material scientist, but this isn't a complicated thing I'm about to say, but, you know, we begin to challenge the materials when we go to the higher burn-ups. And I understand that drives the economics, but I'll go back to my kind of speaking for the NRC staff, which I also shouldn't do, and they'll have an opportunity shortly to speak for themselves. But their difficulty is they're being asked to yield a little bit on margin to make it something that you all would want to deploy and have a reason to deploy, because we have not found a basis to require it. So we're not making mm -hmm. the industry have different fuel than it has now. So that's a part of the balancing of factors and the the, the tug of war and kind of accepting risk and yielding on safety margins that the NRC staff has to do to find this sweet spot of a review that doesn't take 20 years of an amount of physical or testing data that is not as much as they used to have. So this is really, like you said, it's not A plus B equals, you know, C. Yeah. It is a multivariable equation. We have different coefficients than you do, mm -hmm. and we will each arrive at these decisions differently. But uh, I do think that that fuel is like anything else, and there's opportunity for innovation based on the U.S. operating this many reactors for this long. I do think that a 20-year approval process has had an artificial locking in in time of the types of fuels we use now, and that there is a possibility to have better fuel and more economic fuel. I think they can coexist. I guess that would be my answer to Dr. Lyman's question. But how and what it looks like and how much the economics drive the question versus the improved safety are something that NRC is going to have to keep front of mind. And we don't ultimately yield so much safety margin in a qualification of a new fuel, whatever you want to call it, accident tolerant or not, that we actually end up with kind of less safety rigor around fuel than we had. That would be, in my mind, a very, very odd outcome from Fukushima. So that's all I'll say about that, and I'll turn it over to Commissioner Barron. Thanks. Well, thank you all for being here and um, for I, what's been a good discussion. Um, I want to start, there's been a lot of focus on the timelines of how this all plays out, and I wanted to get a little bit of clarity about that. Uh, my, my understanding had been that the industry goal was to do batch loading in 2023. Um, there's also been some talk today about mid-2020s, like 2025, for batch loading of higher uh, burn-up, higher enriched uh, fuels, ATF. Um, are those two separate targets? Are these the same target? Are you envisioning that someone is going to batch load, I'll call it regular, you know, non-higher burn-up, non-higher enrichment um, ATF in hopefully by 2020? that being the goal, or, um, or are folks thinking of skipping directly to the higher burn-up? No, again, I'm, I'm speaking mainly you know, mid-2020s, so 23, 24, 25, that's all the same window, just recognizing the timeline that topical reports will be submitted by year-end, and then it's a 12- to 24-month process for the review and approval by the regulator. <clears throat> At the same time, you have the industry and the fuel vendors working together, if we have that regulatory certainty that the topicals will be submitted, then we can start making the contracts with the fuel vendors because they have to modify their facilities. Okay. So it's just, it, there is so much interplay. Right. I would There's like to tell you that January 1, 2023 is a certainty, but just because of the unknowns and the interplay, it's going to be the mid-2020s for the 
at, uh, uh, deployment of ATF with higher enrichment and higher burnout. And you think that's the first deployment? There isn't, first deployment. A, there isn't an earlier regular ATF deployment. No. That's the first deployment. Okay. And um, that kind of goes to the question. I mean, uh, the, when the NRC staff looks at this, you know, if you look at the project plan, I think they see the critical path as being um, the irradiated testing necessary uh, to fully understand and characterize how the an ATF design acts under different conditions and the modeling of those characteristics. And um, and what I'm trying to get a sense of is, do we think, and if it's 2025, that's an extra couple of years compared to 2023, but do we think there is going to be enough time for that? Um, you know, when Al was talking, he was mentioning, well, you know, we have um, lead test assemblies in there, and you can get unexpected results from that, and that, you know, could create additional work or efforts. I mean, if the target is 2023, 2024, 2025, does this require, like, everything going perfect on the experimental testing side? Is this the kind of best case scenario for all of that work that needs to be done, or we think it's more straightforward than that? Here comes Al. I'm going to ask Al to take that one. I think um, to tee up, I believe in, in research, you don't know what's going to happen. There are always going to be uncertainties. There is a high level of understanding of some of these variables, which gives a level of confidence that those time frames are achievable. But let add, I'll add some color to that. So there are what we call single effects testing and then integral tests, okay? And uh, LTA is integral to a reactor to a uh, certain burn-up rate or burn-up, you know. And uh, in that way, the vendors have done a lot of testing and they've done it in their labs, and they've done it at radiations, uh, MITR, other facilities around the world, okay? So there is some data that they have, and we have a good belief in certain things, and before it goes into a, into a commercial reactor, there's a strong behavioral analysis that is being developed through DOE's work, through the vendor's work, through our work, and it goes to a place where there's a, there's a belief in a safety you know, that, that this is safe to put into a reactor. The questions are, are there other unknowns, 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 or known unknowns that occur, you know, after so much of a burn-up or after so much uh, irradiations? And that is where we have to build that knowledge level up. And so that's where the, the road may divert and we have to do additional research. Maybe it's making the coatings larger or th thicker. Things along these lines that are can be done, fixed through either additional research or additional manufacturing changes. So there's a lot of opportunities here to optimize as we go forward. It took us a long time. It took us 40 to 50 years to optimize Zerk UO2, okay? That came through operational data development and also research. So the combination of both as a function of time and irradiations will get us there. It just, it's, it's gonna take us in. So there's an iterative, iterative approach to this. When we, um you might as well just stay there for a second now. So when, um, I, the, when we last had a commission meeting just focused completely on accident tolerant fuel, I think that was April 2018. And at that time, there really wasn't this focus, I don't think, on the higher burn up, higher enrichment. That seems like it's been kind of a fairly late breaking development in the last year or two. How much does that complicate the kind of experimental side of this to get the data you would need to make a schedule feasible for mid 2020s? It is a challenge, especially with the Halden. Uh, shut down, uh, but there are activities, and we're working. Uh, my colleagues and I are working on uh, plans of how do we pull this in. We did discuss higher enrichment on that slide uh, that has the we call the Christmas tree chart, uh -huh. the red, green, yellow. Uh, we identified uh, higher enrichment, you know, as a possibility because then you get more economic driver to the ATF deployments back in 2018, and we talked about it in our reports as well. Uh, but the focus has been that we now believe we can, re you know, some of the data coming out of the testing and the, and the results that have come out of the LTAs and other things, uh, we're seeing a lot more, you know, benefits of the ATF to then su further support the higher burn up and higher enrichment. And so now that we've seen that, it seems like it's much more doable, and so now it's become much more of a uh, of an opportunity uh, to get us safety benefits, but also allowing the vendor, or the vendors and utilities, to have the economic drivers to introduce something that's safer. Okay. Thank you, um, yeah, Pete. You mentioned there are a lot of moving parts here. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the this was not intended as a pun, but one of those is transportation packages, um, and. Um, 
Uh, you know, if we're talking uh, not about lead test assemblies for a minute, but if we're thinking more about batch loading, full core, um, you know, the new fuels are likely going to need new transportation packages, both for the fresh fuel before it goes into a reactor and then afterwards uh, for spent fuel after it's been irradiated. Um, I think that's particularly true for the higher burn-up fuels for higher enrichment levels beyond 5%. What's the status of efforts to develop and then seek NRC approval for those transportation packages? So that's a, a big focus for the um, licensing and safety benefits task force for 2020. Um, there really is one package that that we believe will be uh, the most critical, and that is the the UF6 uh, package to transport the enriched uh, material from the enrichment plant to the fabrication plant. So the the package we use today is a 30B, and so work needs to be done on on that package to license it to carry greater than five weight percent enrichment. So we believe that's. Uh, the critical path. I don't want to speak too much for the vendors, but I would say that the initial efforts that they've shared with that task force is that they do not see uh, significant hurdles with respect to their uh, fabricated fuel uh, new packages. Okay. Is that true on the back end, too? I mean, I know now we're talking to several years in the future, but after you had, you know, a, a full core, you know, that had been irradiated, do, do we have, I, my sense is we don't have transportation packages now that are certified for that, if, especially if it's higher burn up, higher enrichment. That's right. So uh, the big focus on the back end is around dry storage. Okay. Um, and so EPRI uh, hosted a meeting. Having a dry casket certified. That's that. right. Okay. Is to begin the development of the storage packages uh, for these fuels. Okay. All right. So that's underway, but we're, that's down the road a bit. That's like. correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, in terms of the question about improved plant economics, I think both you know Pete and Neil had slides talking about that. Is the um, do you see the main economic driver for ATF the economic driver, the main economic driver being you know the ability to move PWRs to a 24 month um, refueling cycle? Is that what you see as kind of the thing that delivers the biggest? Yes, correct. So uh, just about uh, every U.S. boiling water reactor, I think except one, is on a 24-month cycle. This would then afford the opportunity for the large four-loop PWRs to move to that 24-month cycle as well. And that's where you really you think that's where you get the real bang for your buck. Yes. Of that. Okay. And then um, I just had one other question, which really isn't a 51-second kind of question, but I'll just ask it anyway and get any thoughts you have. The, you know, the NRC staff, I think, is leaning pretty heavily um, on expert elicitation for phenomena identification. It's the PERT process. We didn't talk about it too much on the first panel, but I think the staff will talk about it a little bit more on the second panel. Um, for new concepts and technologies that may differ significantly from fuels currently used, how, how do we make sure that the PERT process is capturing all of the relevant safety significant issues. I guess this goes a little bit to the point the chairman was making about the unknown unknowns. I think you could have really brilliant people sitting around and looking at the literature and trying to think through what are the phenomena we should be thinking about, but how do we make sure we're not going to miss something vital in that process? <laughs> Any thoughts on that in seven seconds? <laughs> <laughs> Answering it cold a little bit, I think what I see is this fairly unique and open collaboration between all the stakeholders coming together. You have DOE, the utilities, EPRI, the NRC staff all coming together and having these open dialogues around what their concerns are. And from what I've observed from the outside looking in, this is actually doing a great job of bubbling up just those issues, just those concerns, and getting people aligned around what needs to be done. Yeah, I would agree. I think it's that upfront alignment and communication, as opposed to the industry, DOE, the research being done in a vacuum, and then forwarding all the information to the regulator for their review, and then you all go, okay, now what about X, Y, or Z? But if we can do it in parallel and all the questions be answered upfront, I think that's where the efficiencies are gained. Thanks. And I just add, that's kind of what we were founded on, this kind of open challenging ourselves, as well as welcoming, you know, the NRC staff in to challenge us as we go. Um, universities and international uh, participants have also challenged us, so I, I think it's been healthy. Yeah, I, I think fundamentally we want to get it right, and we want to make sure you get it right, too. Okay, thanks. Any final reflections? Uh, yeah, if, if you don't mind. Um, so, yeah, so humans are fallible, so obviously 
that per process has to be informed by confirmatory data. And so I would again stress that um, uh, there are unknowns. Um, you know, historically, you can see that um, things crop up in, in fuel behavior that are surprises. And that's why I would again urge uh, you not to take too many shortcuts. Maybe 20 years is excessive, but um, not to shorten this timeline um, too significantly and potentially miss uh, safety, significant, uh, safety significant factors that could imperil the b batch or full core loading. And uh, for instance, in the example you just discussed, it seems, um, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but the LTA data that's been collected so far is not on high enriched, uh, you know, higher enrichment fuel. And so it seems like there's a gap that's developed between the current data they've collected and the batch loading they're saying sh could be as early as 2023. So it seems that if that's the case, there needs to be a gap analysis to see if there aren't any phenomena that are being missed in, in um, at least the early stages of irradiation of these higher enrichment fuels. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you again to my colleagues and to all the panelists. We will take a break now, a seven-minute break, but we will reconvene sharply at 10.30. Thank you.
you, everyone. The meeting uh, will recommence now with the NRC staff panel, and we will be led off today by Dan Dorman, the Deputy Executive Director for Reactor and Preparedness Programs, who is substituting for our Executive Director today. Dan, thank you very much, and please proceed. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, the staff appreciates the opportunity this morning to provide you with an update on our efforts to and our progress in the licensing of Accident Tolerant Fuel, or ATF. This panel will give you an overview of the work that's being done across the agency to support the implementation of ATF for the operating reactor fleet, while maintaining a strong focus on the agency's mission to protect public health and safety and the environment. Because ATF has the potential to provide benefits to the public and to the operating reactor licensees through increased reactor safety and reduced operating costs, the implementation of ATF has national strategic importance. The Congress has continued to maintain attention on and funding for ATF technologies over the last decade, and Section 107 of the Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act, or otherwise known as NEMA, required the submission of a report from the NRC on the licensing status of ATF, and that report was submitted in January, on January 9th of this year. Uh, as we just heard from the external stakeholder panel, a number of our licensees similarly view ATF as a high priority for their fleets, especially considering the introduction of high burnup and increased enrichment into the ATF domain over the past two years. Uh, finally, uh, we also understand that a the, the success with the ATF is important to the Commission, and the risks associated with ATF are, are being tracked in our quarterly performance review to ensure that we continue to have a high level of leadership engagement on this important topic. The next slide, please. In the last Commission meeting on ATF, which was held on April 12, 2018, the NRC staff described the ATF project plan and how the NRC's approach to licensing ATF will be different than the approach that we took to licensing fuels in the past. Since that last meeting, we have effectively implemented the strategies laid out in the project plan to enable the safe use of emerging fuel technologies, and as a result, we are preparing now to license ne the near-term ATF concepts. We are committed to efficient and effective reviews for ATF applications, focusing on the areas of greatest safety significance and setting aggressive milestones for completing our reviews. We're continually learning from our interactions with stakeholders to sharpen our focus on the issues and building off of our own successes, such as the successful completion of the, the chromium-coated PERT, the Phenomenon Identification and Ranking Table, which was mentioned during the earlier panel, and the associated interim staff guidance uh, that will be discussed by others here at the table. We continue to work towards being a more modern, fuel, agile, and risk-informed regulator. Uh, the current framework is sufficient for us to successfully license accident-tolerant fuels. However, to meet the proposed aggressive ATF development and deployment schedules, this framework is, needs, may need to be modified to improve our review and licensing efficiency while maintaining the agency's safety goals. We will be innovative in our review approach for the topical reports and other licensing applications using available data, risk-informed thinking, engineering judgment, and well-crafted limitations and conditions on licenses as needed uh, to make our finding of reasonable assurance of adequate protection. One example of becoming a more risk-informed regulator is the current use of the PERTs. Historically, PERTs were completed after the regulatory infrastructure was fully developed, if at all. For accident tolerant fuel, we are using PERTs in the development of the regulatory infrastructure, thereby helping us to focus our approach on these new technologies. Looking into the future, we plan to implement a timely and efficient review process for ATF technologies, and together with external stakeholders, we will continue to focus on the development and regulation of these technologies to enable their safe use. Next slide, please. Our first speaker will be Andrea Vale, who will provide an overview of our ATF activities. She will be followed by Mike Ornak, to her right, uh, who will discuss the readiness for licensing near-term concepts. After Mike, Marilyn Diaz, to my far right, uh, will discuss fuel cycle and transportation readiness for accident-tolerant fuel licensing. After Marilyn, we'll come back to my left to Josh Whitman, who will discuss the technical basis for the review of the chromium-coated cladding and in-reactor burn-up extension. And finally, James Corson, on my far left, will provide an update on the preparation of the confirmatory analysis tools for ATF concepts. Next slide, please. 
And with that introduction, I will turn the presentation over to Andrea Vale, our recently appointed Deputy Director for Engineering in the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation. Thanks, Dan, and good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. I'd first like to start with thanking the many staff members that have worked on ATF and have since moved on to different parts of the agency, and also some represented here, but there's a lot of staff working on this project. It's very complex, not just because of the technology that you've heard about, but also, as you heard from the first panel, we're not following the 20-year model, so there's somewhat of a compressed um, time frame. I was in the Office of Nuclear regulatory research before coming to this project, so I'm also bringing those observations and insights. Next slide, please. In order to set ourselves up for success, while of course maintaining public health and safety, we're engaging in three very important activities. The first one is early and frequent engagement with stakeholders. The second is examining the regulatory framework and the processes, as you heard some earlier, and also following emergent technical issues. Next slide, please. With regard to current status, we fully understand how important it is to engage early with our stakeholders. And when we do engage, we stress getting timely information about potential topical report submittals, applications, and amendments. This allows us to really plan effectively to avoid any licensing bottlenecks or any resource implications. But at the same time, we set very clear expectations every time we engage. As Dan mentioned, we'll be flexible in our review, but that is absolutely contingent on complete applications and justifications for us to make our determination of reasonable assurance. And that is something that is stressed every meeting that we go to. We visit often with our colleagues in the Department of Energy. We go to test facilities, manufacturing facilities, and that engagement also encourages good communications with the actual national laboratories where the testing is occurring. We also engage very frequently with the international community, in particular the Office of Nuclear, Nuclear, Nuclear Regulatory Research um, fosters those international relationships both by going to international labs and going to research reactors in the international community. Uh, one aspect of the international, as you heard earlier, is the closing of Halden, and so you can hear more about that from James Corson, but we have considered that in our deliberations. Research is also engaging in a very important activity, which is refining the confirmatory analysis codes, which James will also detail in his presentation. Within the NRC, the ATF Steering Committee and the ATF Working Group meets at least monthly, but sometimes more often as needed to address emergent issues and to assess those issues as they come up. And in my opinion, I'm early to the project, but this project is an excellent example of successfully working in a matrix organization and keeping focus on the project. Next slide, please. You've heard a lot in the first panel about the regulatory framework, and we are assessing that regulatory framework and processes. As you also heard, uh, 10 CFR 50.68 has an explicit limit of 5% enrichment for fuel assemblies. There are currently two materials licensees, Part 70 materials licensees, that are in-house with amendments. This gets convoluted very quickly, but the Part 70 licensees have amendments in-house. For reactor operators, an exemption would be required to receive fuel enriched above 5%. Another known challenge, of course, is NRC resources. We currently have the skill sets and the resources needed to license these technologies, but of course in our engagements we stress the importance of having up-to-date information so that we can continue to plan for the foreseeable future. But I do want to stress we do have the skill sets and resources for what we know is forthcoming for ATF licensing. Next slide, please. The staff is following emerging technical issues, and as you know, reactor designs, meaning uranium dioxide pellets with the zirconium alloy cladding, has virtually remained unchanged for the past 50 years in the U.S. fleet. 
So we're following these emerging technical issues because it's evolving and it takes our focus and we really have to react quickly to figure out, you mentioned unknown unknowns, to kind of stack the deck and figure out as much as we can with the information that we have. By following these emergent issues, we can react quicker. Now, of course, we're not making any presupposed promises, but this could result in faster issuance of regulatory guidance or safety evaluations if we have more information up front. And although it's not a new phenomenon, the, com the commission and the TAs have heard about um, fuel fragmentation, relocation, and dispersal in different CA briefs and in other meetings, or otherwise known as FFRD, and you'll hear more about that in Josh Whitman's presentation. So in summary, overall, we spent a significant amount of time understanding both licensing challenges and technical challenges surrounding ATF licenses. And we have confidence that we can license in the requested time frame, frames, but of course I can't stress that's contingent on complete applications and those applications have to reflect the lessons learned that we've both discussed in collaboration and, and put very clear messages out in every interaction that we have with both DOA vendors, licensees, and whoever else will listen to us about ATF. Next slide, please. The next speaker will be Mike Ornak, who's the project manager for the ATF project. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, good morning, uh, Chairman and Commissioners. I'm here today to discuss the readiness for licensing near-term ATF concepts. Next slide, please. We consider ATF technologies near-term when we can rely on the existing data, models, and methods in a review of industry submittals. There are three technologies that we consider near-term. First is chrome-encoded cladding. One vendor has stated they'll be coming in with a topic report in 2020. Um, no power reactor licensees have stated they're going to adopt chroma coated cladding yet. Second technology is dope pellets. We have approved dope pellets for BWR applications. Uh, when it comes to PWR applications, a couple vendors are exploring that too. Third technology is Fredic steel alloy cladding, which is also known as FICRO cladding. Two, uh, two licensees have lead test assemblies inside the reactors. However, no topical report uh, submittal dates have been uh, told to us yet. Next slide, please. The ATF project plan is being, being followed. In the April 2018 uh, commission meeting, a new paradigm was introduced. In this new paradigm, the development of technical bases by the licensee will happen in parallel with the refinement of the regulatory infrastructure. The benefit of this arrangement is that it allows licensing to start earlier, where previously the, the licensing had happened after the development of the technical bases. Next slide, please. Two examples of how we're following the project plan. As Dan had discussed earlier, we completed a chromium-coated PERT in January of 2019. The use of the PERT is a proactive licensing approach that allows more efficient refinement of the regulatory infrastructure. We use the PERT in the development of the interim staff guidance. Parts for other subjects are currently scheduled, and that will be discussed by, by James later. The second example is our issuance of the uh, interim staff guidance. The interim staff guidances are normally issued after applications are received because the staff will finally have an idea on what the licensees are going to present to us. Uh, because of our interactions with the vendors and stakeholders, our interactions have allowed the early issuance well before we received any top of reports or license amendment requests. Both documents support staff efficiency, they avoid multiple RIA rounds, and provide regulatory certainty for licensees. Next slide, please. The staff is being flexible and responsive to stakeholder needs. The industry uses lead test assemblies to obtain data to make the safety case for new fuel designs. Since the last commission meeting, NEI had requested clarification on licensing requirements due to the interest in accident tolerant fuel lead test assemblies. We issued a response of June of last year. The LTA letter provides guidance on terms limited number and non-limiting core regions, the use of approved codes and methods, the use of 10 CFR 5059, which is changes, tests, and experiments, the use of exemptions to 10 CFR 5046, which is acceptance criteria for emergency core cooling. The LTA, LTA letter ensured regulatory consistency and reduced misunderstandings regarding the insertions of LTAs. A second example of us being responsive is the issuance of Appendix A to the project plan, which is entitled Fuel Burn Up and Enrichment Ex Extension Preparation Strategy. <coughs> Due to industry and Department of Energy 
activities regarding high burn up and increased enrichment, revised, we decided to revise the project plan and that was issued in October of 2019. Next slide, please. Early and frequent communication is key to the success of the project plan and the NR staff is following through. If you look on the top row of the slide, I've already discussed the project plan in the LTA letter. And on the top right is RIS 2019-03, which is pre-application communication scheduling for ATF submittals. This RIS requested scheduling information from Part 70, 71, and 72 vendors, and this assists the NRC staff in workload planning. To date, we received two responses, and we hope to receive a third response in the middle of next month. We continue to engage vendors and licensees. These interactions allow us to stay up to date on technical developments, changes to licensing strategies and schedules. We encourage pre-application meetings with vendors and licensees <laughs> to take care of any issues before they arise when we have applications. One example of an interaction with vendors was the development of the ISGs is accelerated to the end of 2019. Originally, we had planned to issue the ISG at a later date, but when one vendor came in and said they had submitted a top report by the end of 2019, we accelerated our schedule and managed to issue it, as I said, on January 3rd of this year, well before we received any topical reports. We meet with industry representatives and working groups, and, provide, and during these group meetings, industry provides a high-level overview of direction and schedules. And finally, we put forth significant effort to interact with stakeholders, especially the public. In some of the public meetings, as you can see on the slide, there was not a open sub subject, or, uh, sorry, open portion of the meeting because it was totally proprietary. The staff decided to, or requested, an open portion of the beginning of those meetings to interact with the public. Next slide, please. We are ready for known forthcoming applications. The current regulatory framework is suitable for review and licensing of ATF. For high burn up and increased enrichment, the framework is, still continues to be acceptable. However, as discussed earlier by Andrea regarding 10 CFR 5068, should widespread adoption occur of increased enrichment, rulemaking will commence to facilitate a more predictable licensing process. For Chromium code, we've issued, or we've completed the PERT and issued this interim staff guidance, and we're waiting for the topic report applications. The staff will review the need for other guidance documents on a routine basis. To ensure we're ready for power reactor license amendment requests, we're developing a licensing roadmap. This licensing roadmap accounts for variations within amendment requests for coded cladding, cladding changes, increased enrichment, and high burnout. For this roadmap, we'll identify resources, timelines, review steps, and special circumstances, such as review for the, for, with the ACRS. Once we complete the draft licensing roadmap, We'll perform validation and verification using non-standard previous fuel reviews to confirm that all parts of the licensing process are taken account for. After we're completed with the licensing roadmap, we'll execute a, few, a couple tabletop exercises that will process, that'll process simulated amendment requests to identify bottlenecks and other re resource needs. And finally, when the amendment requests do come in, we will have the analysis tools ready to make our safety case and those will be discussed by James in his presentation. Overall, we are following the project plan. We're completing licensing actions in parallel with industry progress on the technical bases, and our communication with stakeholders allow us to be ready for the forthcoming ATF technologies. I'd like to turn the presentation over to Marilyn Diaz, a chemical engineer in the Office of Nuclear Materials Safety and Safeguards. Thank you, Mike. Good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. I will be providing an overview of the status of accident tolerant fuel as it relates to the front and back end of the fuel cycle, including the accomplishments we've we ach achieved so far. During my presentation, I will address how NMSS is focused on preparing for these new technologies. Next slide, please. We are effectively implementing strategies to support the industry's 2023 goal of deploying ATF. We have taken a bigger role at the table with industry increased interest on deploying ATF with higher enrichment levels and burn up. We are making progress and here are some of our recent accomplishments. We issued two special authorizations for the achievement of the lead test assemblies or LTAs. This action allows fuel vendors to transport a limited number of LTAs to the reactor sites. 
We also issue a revision to a certificate of compliance for one transportation package vendor authorizing the transport of ATF assemblies for chromium coated cladding and up to 5% enrichment. This action allows the fuel vendor to transport an unlimited amount of ATS assemblies to the reactor site. Since the last commission meeting, NMSS staff worked with NRR to issue Appendix A of the project plan, addressing the strategy to prepare the agency for the review of future licensing actions, including license amendments to go beyond the current 5% enrichment limits. And lastly, staff develop a critical path identifying the schedule and time frame for licensing actions needed to support the industry plan to deploy ATF with higher enrichments in 2023. This critical path was sent to the Nuclear Energy Institute in August 2019. To support 2023 deployment of ATF with high assay, low enriched uranium, NRC must receive an application to increase fuel enrichment by August 2021. Next slide, please. We are effectively implementing strategies identified in the project plan. As we continue to license these new technologies and prepare for the future actions, we are building on our processes in a smarter way. We continue to enhance and revise our own licensing practices. We continue to make progress in becoming a modern risk-informed regulator. For example, in preparation for the ATF and HALU amendment request, we gather a team representing each technical area to evaluate the risk associated with the future applications. The risk insights gained from the approach better informed the scope of the reviews. In October, we received our first license amendment request to fabricate fuel with enrichments up to 8% from Global Nuclear Fuel Americas. And in November, we received a license amendment request from Louisiana Energy Services to allow them to enrich up to 5.5% enrichment. Additionally, we received an application from GE Hitachi for transport of irradiated ATF in the GE 2000 package. Increased communication with licensees and asking questions early, like issuing requests for supplemental information during the acceptance review, has improved the efficiency of these reviews. To prepare for these technologies, we have also been conducting an assessment of the current regulatory framework and processes to identify and resolve any licensing issues. We evaluate 10 CFR Part 70 and 71 for the review of enriching fuel above 5% for the transportation of UF6, uranium hexafluoride, for fuel fabrication and fresh fuel transportation of the ATF near-term concepts with HALU. Today, we have not identified any significant regulatory or technical challenges for the near-term ATF concept with HALU for the front end of the fuel cycle. We continue to evaluate our regulations to determine if review of these technologies will require rulemaking. To date, no changes to 10 CFR Part 70 or 71 is needed to accommodate these new technologies. We will engage the Commission if rulemaking is needed. An example of our analysis is that staff has identified that for transporting UF6, HALU, licensees will be required to provide an evaluation of optimum moderation per 10 CFR 7155. One viable option is that licensees may request an exemption from this requirement. In addition, we're working with Office of Research to assess the availability of criticality benchmarking data for higher enrichments and cladding performance for spent fuel. Next slide, please. Another strategy we're successfully implementing is early and frequent engagement. We have amplified our engagement with internal and external stakeholders. This facilitates a common understanding of the new technolog technologies we will need to be prepared to license and the timelines for the proposed deployment of these technologies. For example, as mentioned before, staff sent a letter to NEI identifying when we need to receive applications for the use of ATF with HALU to support the 2023 goal. During the 2020 Regulatory Information Conference, we have a fuel management track, which includes a session on licensing, storage, and transportation of ATF. Through different forums like this conference, other public meetings, and communications with industry, we're working to identify and address challenges early. 
We are also actively participating in the industry's ATF working group that was formed to discuss regulatory and technical initiatives that are needed to support ATF with Halium. Additionally, we are actively engaging and encouraging pre-application interactions and utilizing our various forms for engaging external stakeholders. For example, staff has engaged in pre-application interactions with licensees regarding their upcoming amendment to transport ATF fuel with Halio. Their licensing action is expected to be submitted in early 2020. Next slide, please. Lastly, we are engaging in early training, research requests, and continued dialogue with internal and external stakeholders as new information comes available on these technologies, with the goal of ensuring that our workforce is fully equipped with knowledge and skills needed to support the workload. To ensure we can support the expected amendments and new applications, we factor the skills necessary to support these reviews into the strategic workforce planning process, so we have the staff needed to meet the workload demand. For example, we're ensuring staff completes cross-qualifications in key technical areas to enhance their agility and enable the review of future license applications. In addition, we're conducting training for NRC staff. We successfully coordinated a seminar given by Oak Ridge National Labs last July on ATF. This seminar was recorded for future use by the NRC staff. We will continue to assess the need to train staff on specific topics related to ATF and HALU. This reaches the end of my presentation. I will now turn it to Josh Whitman. Josh is a nuclear engineer in the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation and will be talking about the technical basis for chromium coated cladding and higher burn up. Thank you, Marilyn, and good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll start by talking about one of our biggest accomplishments since the last commission meeting, the issuance of the interim staff guidance, or the ISG, on chromium-coated cladding, which was issued in January of this year. The ISG describes what should be addressed in licensing submittals for, for coated claddings. So first, I'll step through this pyramid from the bottom up, describing the process and inputs that we use to get to the final ISG. We began with a literature search performed by Pacific Northwest National Labs, or PNNL. This used the EPRI gap analysis, other documents in the public literature, as well as PNNL's expertise from providing contract support for fuel reviews to create a, a document that was uh, described the state of knowledge of chromium coatings on, in their use in reactors. This document was then provided as background to experts who would form the Phenomena Identification and Ranking Table panel, also known as a PERT panel. This panel then met in April of last year and uh, added their, the experts reviewed this document and provided their professional recommendations and insights based on their expertise. Uh, these experts were from the nuclear and coding fields in both industry and academia, and they worked through and created a ranked list of material properties, specified acceptable fuel design limits, also known as SAFTLs, and new degradation mechanisms, and ranked them by knowledge and uh, importance level. So these rankings, as well as the uh, discussion at the PERT panel, were then incorporated into the final PERT report, which was released in June of last year. From there, we created the ISG by adapting the PERT report, adding more focused guidance for reviewers. And we completed this all on an accelerated schedule, going from the final PERT report to issued guidance in just about seven months. We did that in order to ensure that the ISG was issued before the first coded cladding topical reports were submitted to the NRC for review. Although we had an accelerated process, we also, did, we also incorporated stakeholders throughout the process and throughout the development of the ISG by holding the PERT publicly, releasing the PERT report publicly, holding multiple public meetings throughout the ISG development process, including a ACRS subcommittee meeting, and by uh, noticing the ISG for public comment and incorporating uh, stakeholder feedback. Next slide, please. So what is in this ISG? The ISG is intended to supplement the standard review plan, or SRP. And uh, the plan is to eventually incorporate it into the SRP after we've had the ability to exercise it through the first topical report submittals and work out any kinks that we might find. 
ISG contains guidance for reviewers to supplement the guidance in Chapter 4, Reactor, in Chapter 15, Transient Accident Analysis of the Standard Review Plan. It also includes that list of material properties, saftals, and new degradation mechanisms I just I talked about on the PERT slide. Um, th by issuing the ISG, we in hope to ensure, or we will ensure, regulatory reliability and consistency between reviews and uh, different reviewers for the coded claddings as they are submitted to us. Next slide, please. So with the issuance of the ISG, the NRC is now ready to review coded cladding topical reports. But there is one key challenge, which is the limited data at high burnup that's going to be available for these technologies while they're submitted. Now, as the previous panel discussed a little bit, historically, fuel vendors have waited until they've collected data at the full range of requested burnup before submitting a topical report to the NRC for review. Well, this simplifies the review process. Uh, it has the downside of requiring many years just to achieve the burn-up and then additional time to uh, perform the post-radiation examinations and collect the data from, uh, in order to submit that with the topical report. Additionally, if there's any benefits for the new fuel design, many plants may need to wait until they've achieved a full core of that design through three reloads um, before they can fully uh, achieve those benefits in licensing space. So to help alleviate some of that lag, uh, we're willing to look at a phased approach to licensing of the coded cladding designs, which is what's uh, uh, described in the diagram on the slide. In a phased approach, vendors would first submit topical reports with data collected to an intermediate burn-up level, and staff would put appropriate conditions and limitations on burn-up um, based on this data. And then in the future, as they collect more data, vendors could submit um, this data to the NRC as a supplement to the topical report to uh, either remove or raise the limitation on burnup. Additionally, fuel vendors would likely need to submit a separate topical report or supplement the topical report to claim the benefits for the uh, new cladding materials or the, the new coatings uh, as they collect that data. And so that can be done in parallel with the first plants starting to load uh, to starting to batch load these uh, coated claddings. Next slide, please. So another major accomplishment that we've uh, had since the last commission meeting is the high burn up and increased enrichment appendix to the ATF project plan, which was issued in October of last year. The appendix follows the same general format as the ATF project plan with four major focus areas. In reactor regulatory framework, regulatory framework for fuel cycle, transportation, and storage, probabilistic risk assessment activities, and independent confirmatory calculation activities. The purpose of the project plan appendix is to prepare the agency for efficient and effective licensing of high burn up and increased enrichment when, uh, when submittals come in. We included uh, input from the public in this process through a public meeting and submitted comments. And we're now working to implement the plan, much like we're working to implement the ATF portion of the project plan. Next slide, please. So as part of this process, we need to develop the technical basis for high burnout fuel. Uh, as we described in SECI 15-148, uh, one phenomena sensitive to high burnout is fuel fragmentation, relocation, and dispersal, also known as FFRD. FFRD is the observation that, under certain accident conditions, high burnout fuel may break into small pieces, which could then relocate within the fuel rod and potentially disperse into the primary coolant if the fuel cladding were to rupture. We have a growing understanding that shows that fuel is not susceptible to FFRD until it achieves greater than the current burnup limits, but it may be susceptible below the burnup limits being proposed by industry. As you can see from the slide, below the current burn-up limits, the fuel particles are large, whereas above the current burn-up limits, uh, the fuel fragments into much smaller pieces that would have a greater propensity to relocate or disperse. So industry is aware of FFRD and uh, recognizes its importance to demonstrating uh, the safety of high burn-up fuel. Uh, both industry and the NRC participate in inter international research programs that are working to gain further understanding of the phenomena. And as part of the early engagement described in the project plan appendix, NRC attended a EPRI workshop on high burn-up fuel just last month 
where FFRD was a uh, primary topic of discussion. But FFRD is not currently addressed in any licensees and analyses of record, and moving to high burnout fuel, it may need to be disposition. Next slide, please. So as laid out in the project plan and the project plan appendix, staff have had considerable early engagement with all of our stakeholders, industry, DOE, the national labs, EPRI, and the public. Uh, in the last year, we've visited both Oak Ridge National Lab, where the picture on the left was taken, and Idaho National Labs to view experimental setups and experiments being run on ATF. This can provide invaluable context to data that's submitted with topical reports that are collected from these experimental setups for the uh, context for the reviewers and help to um, reduce the questions and uh, improve the review process. We've also observed coding processes at two different vendor sites. And as industries stepped up their focus on high burn up, we've stepped up our engagement there as well, attending two EPRI high burn up workshops. And we're also holding a RIC session in a couple of weeks on the same topic. We've also attended DOE's advanced fuel campaign meetings and EPRI DOE INL ATF workshop where uh, I was at last week, where uh, industry presents some of the uh, new developments in research, um, some of the new data they've collected, and DOE goes over some of their plans for the program. We've also attended top, the, top fuel, fuel, uh, the Top Fuel Conference, where ATF has been a um, hot topic in recent years. And finally, we have regular interactions with vendors to understand changes in their licensing strategies as they evolve. We hold these as uh, notice meetings with open portions to improve transparency with the public and our other stakeholders. So next up, I'm going to hand it over to James Corson, who will be discussing the preparation of confirmatory analysis tools for ATF concepts. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. So I'm going to be talking about the various activities that we have ongoing in the Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research to support licensing of accident tolerant fuel. Next slide, please. So our efforts in the Office of Research fall into three broad categories. The first is preparation of our confirmatory analysis tools for fuel performance, neutronics, thermal hydraulics, and severe accidents in source term. And these, light, or these uh, confirmatory analysis tools help our licensing process by verifying the, the type of information that the vendors are submitting. The second major area of activity is participation in international research programs to obtain data for our code development and for validation and to increase our understanding of safety significant phenomena. And then the third major area uh, the Office of Research is leading the literature reviews and PERT activities for accident tolerant fuel and for burn up and enrichment extension. And as previous speakers have mentioned, uh, PERTs are a really key part of our ATF project plan. They help us to become a more modern risk informed regulator because they help us identify the areas that are of greatest safety significance so that we can focus our review on those things. So I'll be discussing our efforts in these three areas on the following slides. Next slide, please. So first, our, we've done a lot of work to update our computer codes to be more modular and flexible so that they can support different fuel types. On the left of the slide, you see a representation of the old way of doing things, where the material properties and the physics models and solution methods are all sort of jumbled together. And this makes it a lot more difficult to change out new material properties. As a result of that, we've made a number of efforts to remove those material properties and put them in separate libraries. So for our fast fuel performance code, we've actually created a separate material properties library. So this makes it more resource efficient to modify existing fuel properties, as well as to add properties for new concepts like chromium coated cladding. So of course this reduces a lot of redundancy and a lot of effort, which is a good thing. And this has benefits not just for ATF, which motivated this activity, but for existing fuels as well. So the material properties that we use in our codes come from a variety of sources. They come from the open literature. 
They come from international research programs and from material properties handbooks that are published by the Department of Energy and the national labs. Likewise, we work closely with our counterparts at the labs and with our international counterparts to develop new models for our codes and also to obtain the data we need to validate the codes. And as Josh, Josh mentioned, getting this data is, of course, a challenge, but we interact quite frequently with the Department of Energy and the vendors to remain up to date on their test plans so that we're as prepared as we can be. Next slide, please. So I already mentioned how we separated out the material properties from our fast fuel performance code into a dedicated library. We can also use this same material properties library in some of our other tools, like the trace thermal hydraulics code. And again, this just reduces some of the redundancy for code development, which is very useful when we're adding new properties. But then it also has benefits for existing uh, UO2 Zerk when we have to do long-term maintenance on the codes. So just another area where we've significantly improved our codes as a result of ATF activities. Next slide, please. The second area where the Office of Research is leading activities related to ATF and burn-up and enrichment extensions is international research. So we rely heavily on international research to obtain the data we need for code development, for material properties, uh, and for validation data. And these international research programs greatly increase our understanding of safety significant phenomena. So I have just a few of the programs we participate in listed here. Uh, first up is the Studsvik Cladding Integrity Project which has provided valuable data on fuel fragmentation, relocation, and dispersal phenomena that Josh had mentioned previously. Um, the SKIP program also provides information on the back end of the fuel cycle, so that's relevant to work ongoing in NMSS. Uh, I also have listed uh, reactivity insertion accident uh, tests that we follow. There have been some tests done at the nuclear safety research reactor in Japan on doped fuel, so we follow those tests. And we also participate in the Cabri International Project at the Cabri reactor in France to obtain data on high burn up and doped fuel RIA tests. And then the last thing I have listed up here is we've obtained valuable information on iron, chromium, aluminum cladding behavior during the LOCA and subsequent quench from the quench facility in Germany. So all of these programs provide valuable data for our codes as well as enhance our understanding of safety significant phenomena. Next slide, please. So the last area I wanna talk about is PERTs. And the previous speakers have uh, mentioned quite a bit the chrome-coated PERT, so I'm not gonna dwell on that any further. I'll also mention that uh, more recently we've completed a literature review on fuel performance considerations and data needs for fuel above current uh, burn-up limits. So that literature review was completed by our contractors at Pacific Northwest National Lab, and it's publicly available. So it identified what data is already out there for our codes, as well as some of the data that needs to be collected to support licensing of high burn-up fuel. We also have literature reviews ongoing with PNNL related to chrome-coated cladding and iron chromium aluminum cladding, fresh fuel transport, and spent fuel transport and storage. So those, are, those um, literature reviews will be published in the next couple of years. And then the last major PERT activity I want to talk about is the severe accident and source term PERT, which will be coming later this year. Next slide, please. So the severe accident and source term PERT for ATF and burn-up and enrichment extensions will increase our knowledge of severe accident and source term behavior. And this will feed into a number of different activities at NRC. So this knowledge improves uh, our ability for emergency planning and incident response. Uh, it also helps with our code development activities for the MELCOR severe accident and source term code. 
and Melcor is used to help support regulatory source term development, and it's also used to help support development of sur uh, surrogate criteria for a probabilistic risk assessment. And these surrogate criteria, in turn, are used in regulatory cost-benefit analysis anytime we need to evaluate new requirements or backfits. So these are just some of the areas that the severe accident PERT will help feed into. It'll help identify areas where ATF or high burnout fuel may behave differently than the existing UO2 Zerk system, and it'll help us identify where we need to adjust our guidance. So those are the activities that we have ongoing in the Office of Research. I'd like to now turn it back to Dan for some closing remarks. Thank you, James. Uh, if I could have the next slide. And the next one. So I, I, I want to conclude with the people. Uh, you see here a number of the NRC staff working on the implementing the ATF project plan, including the, several of the folks here at the table. Uh, this is not obviously an exclusive list. We have, as you see before you, uh, several offices of the agency actively engaged in, in the full life cycle of accident tolerant fuel and making sure that we're thinking through all of the implications of accident tolerant fuel. But I, I would be remiss to stop there and not acknowledge the significant collaboration that you've heard about from both panels. I think the, the collaboration and particularly the pre-application discussions are critical to our success in, in meeting the objectives for a timely implementation of accident tolerant fuels. Uh, the, the uh, preparation that, that goes into that enables the staff to be better prepared for the applications that will come before us. That you see translated into interim staff guidance, which is review guidance for the staff, but also helps guide people preparing applications to know what are, what are the important issues that the staff will be focused on in reviewing their application and enables us to have more confidence that we will be able to deliver a timely safety decision uh, at the appropriate time. So with that, uh, that concludes the staff remarks, uh, and we look forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much, Dan. In addition to that photo of that happy bunch, um, I, I want to note that uh, something very rare, I've sat around this table at a lot of commission meetings for over 12 years now, and we have achieved gender parity around this table. I have to tell you that's very, <laughs> very rare. I don't know how many times this has ever occurred for us, but with that, we will, um, I will turn to my colleague. Thank you for helping with gender parity on this side of the table, Commissioner Caputo. Thank you. Uh, and I'd like to just start by making an observation just about the wealth of expertise uh, sitting at this table. And I know that for each one of you that are here, there is a cadre of staff who also contribute their expertise to the nature of what's being done here. Um, but I do think it's really remarkable just um, the level of intellectual heft that's being applied here. And so thank you for all contributing your best work to this effort. Um, Mr. Dorman, let me start with you with a question. I think this should be fairly easy and straightforward, but do you believe the staff is proceeding with an appropriate safety focus on accident tolerant fuel, or is there a risk of compromising safety in order to meet the industry's preferred schedule, as Dr. Lyman contends? I, I do believe we're maintaining an appropriate safety focus on this. I, 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 if I could briefly leverage the, the question uh, the chairman mentioned, unknown unknowns, this process that is uh, much shorter than our traditional 20-year process is a stepwise process. As I, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, and, and I think Josh touched on it as well, there, there may be license restrictions and conditions as we go through the steps of the process, and the approvals that we will have will be for the next step of the process until we get to the point of a full approval of, of, of uh, ultimately full load of course. And those will be based on, on the data that we have at the time we make those decisions that give us enough confidence in the safety determination to go the next step. Definitely a strong safety focus. Okay, thank you. Um, Dan, I'm going to come back to you with another one. So, Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act required us to submit a report to Congress on our progress on this issue. And we reported that the existing regulatory framework is generally acceptable for licensing near-term ATF fuel designs using amendments and exemptions. Now, Andrea has indicated that we still 
Uh, we're still assessing the need for rulemaking and new updated guidance documents. And I know this is also mentioned by uh, Mr. Ornak. So can you just give me a little clarity here? Sure. Uh, so, uh, and Andrea touched on, on a couple of areas, and I think Dr. Lyman touched on 5046. So there's a number of things in play that could adjust the framework if you made a decision on 5046. 5068, obviously, at some point, if, if there is broad implementation of higher enrichments than 5% in the reactor fleet, it would be prudent for the commission to update its framework to reflect the higher enrichment than what is currently allowed in 5068. But that does, is not an impediment to us approving on a case basis uh, the use of accident tolerant fuels going forward. So we can do an exemption to 5068 as an example uh, to, to allow more than a 5% enrichment in the reactor. So, so we can do it in the existing framework. If this ends up being a broadly deployed uh, material in, in the fleet, at some point it will be prudent for us to update the regulatory framework. I think between now and some point in the future, we're going to continue to learn more uh, that will be valuable at, in forming the regulatory basis of what such an update to the regulatory framework would look like. Okay, so if I can shift to Mike and maybe have him contribute a little bit here, because on slide 13, he has a bar that says refinement of regulatory infrastructure, which both precedes and overlaps licensing activities. So that suggests that there is regulatory work that needs to be regulatory done. Regulatory work meaning the interim staff guidance. I mean, at least that's for chromium coated cladding. Okay, so the interim staff guidance was issued, mm -hmm. but only for the chromium cladding. Correct. So this applies. This implies that there is refinement of other regulatory infrastructure for other. ATF technologies? This is a, the ATF project plan is a general framework for all of the technologies. And so for the other ones, I don't think we have it defined on what we're going to do for the regulatory infrastructure yet. Because that's the only one we see, you know, forthcoming right now is chrome coated cladding. Okay. Well, this takes me to my other question. So I've heard several times this morning that we're prepared to license near-term ATF concepts. But I'm hearing there may be regulatory infrastructure work that needs to be done. Um, there is also the potential for assessing criticality research and whether there's available, uh, enough data available. And there's also the discussion of preparing con uh, confirmatory analysis tools. So. So I guess my question is, you know, we're prepared to license, but does that actually mean we're ready now, or we'll be ready by the time applications come in, or we'll finish getting ready after applications come in? Because if we need to wait and see what applications look like in order to provide guidance, then applicants don't have the benefit of the guidance in preparing their applications, which makes it more difficult for application for for applicants to submit complete high quality applications. So I'm I'm sort of struggling to figure out our degree of preparedness because it doesn't sound like we are prepared is quite the clear definitive statement um, that it would suggest. So uh, I'll go back to Pete Senna's comment about A plus B plus C and then it's calculus. I think we're in the transition to calculus. So up to this point, we've been from the regulator side doing the PERT, doing the ISG. We've been doing the A plus B plus C. What we need is the data. What we need is the topicals. So that's the next step. And we're ready to get that data and get those topicals. There's a potential for the unknown unknown in the topical. We'll see. Um, but that will be the next step that will prepare the applicants for the LARS, the, the license amendment requests that they will need to batch load the fuel. Um, so, so there is there is a uh, an element of, of yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts here, and we as we get closer to each moving part, we're, we're I think what what we're seeing in the collaboration and in the implementation of the project plan is the engagement that we need to have confidence that at the next step we're going to be ready. We are ready for the next step. We're ready to receive the topical report on chromium cladded fuels. 
Um, but and and we're also, uh, you know, I'll take this opportunity to jump into to Tiger teams and, and acceptance reviews and some of the more general things that are broader than just ATF that are going on throughout the agency to to improve the process of of accepting the the, the application for review and laying out a review plan uh, that will be very focused on the important safety issues. So I think so. I, so I'm confident that we're ready for the next step. I'm confident that we have a project plan that will have us ready for the further steps as they come. And I'd like to just add that um, this is partly what happened when the initial ATF plan was sent out. There wasn't an a expectation that the increased um, enrichment in Hiberna would be coming at the same time as ATF. And that's why we have such early and frequent engagement. When the staff became aware that that was going to be something that the industry was going forward with, that's when we got together, got the appendix out last October. So we are iterating, I think, is, is it um, Mr. Santos said from EPRI on the information that we get and then executing based on that information, but we are ready to license chromium coated. Okay. No, I'm just going to make a caution here that I think if we're going to make statements that we are prepared to license near term ATF concepts, there's a difference between we are prepared and we're getting prepared. And given the level of scrutiny and public attention to this, I think we need to be incredibly frank and precise in our use of language. Um, because if we say that we're prepared, that's very easily interpreted by external stakeholders as, oh, okay, they're ready. But we're not, because there's still a fair amount of work being done. So I think we just need to be a little bit more precise in our language um, and, and a little more clear about the nature of that. Um, so, Ms. Diaz, one last quick question for you. Uh, you stated that you're working with the Office of Research to assess the availability of criticality benchmarking data. If the necessary data isn't available, how long do you think it takes to develop that data? So what we're saying is that currently for the near term concepts, we are ready to review license applications with higher enrichments more for about 5%. Um, the work that's been done with the Office of Research and the, do the literature review that will be done is to further inform our reviews and to more efficiently conduct our reviews. So um, we've there is a plan that will address for higher enrichments going from 5% to 8% and that will be conducted in the near term to inform that. Um, but for right now, I think we have enough um, to review the applications with all the alternatives like um, the applications will, de will need to provide um, a bigger margin of safety when it comes to criticality, and um, we'll have to provide additional information on the uncertainty and sensitivity analysis for the criticality safety evaluations. Okay, safety evaluations. So does that mean you need that data in order to make licensing decisions on near term? So we believe we don't need the data okay. to be able to review if something comes so in So what tomorrow. safety evaluations is it that you need to have this data by and what's the time frame for that? How I think, far out are we looking? So um, more or less, do you have the time you need to develop the data you need if it's not available? Um, I have here Drew Bardo sure. from the Office Hi, of Drew Bardo, NMSS. NMSS. Um, so Critical experiments have been done in the past. This is the kind of data that we're looking for for criticality code validation. There, there likely aren't going to be any more done. So as far as that type of data coming down the, the pike, it doesn't look like we're going to get any more. So we're in a situation you have more than 1,000 critical experiments below 5 weight percent available to you. Um, we're looking at now what's available above 5 weight percent, and that's not to say if there's not as many, which we already know there's not as many, that you, you can't validate. You can validate. We already have in our NRC guidance uh, methods for uh, 
extrapolating code bias and bias uncertainty beyond your range of applicability. Necessarily, your margins your margins get larger because the uncertainty is larger. So there's there's an option there for how to do that. We also have uh, better computational tools for looking at existing critical experiments, and those are the uh, sensitivity uncertainty analysis techniques uh, that have been uh, developed uh, primarily by Oak Ridge National Lab for looking at critical experiments. So there's lots of critical some critical experiments in that range that might not look like they're applicable to what we want to license that may in fact be applicable. Um, so we just have to do that work to look at that. But we can we can license uh, this now with existing methods for uh, extrapolating beyond the range of applicability for code bias and bias uncertainty. Okay, thank you. Thank you, next we'll hear from Commissioner Wright. Thank you, thank you for the discussion today and preparation. I do agree with your comments earlier, uh, Andrea, that uh, a lot of people backing you up, and uh, with, you know they uh, they they are appreciated for what they do. Um, we kind of probably going to go back into some of this again uh, that's already been discussed to some level, and I'm going to start with you again, uh, Andrea, and and, and please. Um, Marilyn, if you feel like you need to jump in, jump in. Um, my understanding is that many of the issues we're discussing today, um, and I think I referred to it in the first panel, um, for accident tolerant fuel with uh, higher enrichments and burn-up will be um, applicable to advanced reactor fuels um, that may use the high SALEO. Um, can you give me a little bit more uh, detail, maybe uh, an, an overview of how you're integrating these efforts? Um, and will the uh, resolution of technical and policy issues for accident tolerant fuel with higher enrichments and burn up also apply to uh, and make it easier to license advanced reactor fuels? Can you maybe talk a little bit about that? I can start at a high level and then Marilyn may be able to add more for HALU. But some of the um, lessons learned that we're getting both in the uh, confirmatory analysis tools mm -hmm. and some of the other knowledge we're getting with um, assessing some of the accident tolerant fuel technologies are helping us to, number one, gain efficiencies because we don't have the, the 20 years and the benefit of the data that, that the chairman talked about. So we do have to use innovative techniques to figure out how we're going to license this. And no way are we minimizing safety or trying to take shortcuts in, in any way. So it's really stretching the staff's capabilities, and that's why the PERTs are so important. Um, and by nature of a PERT, you're getting the experts in the field. So you're going out getting the people, no matter matter where they are that are experts in the field to do this. So we are working together and a broad, um, you know, across the agency as, as a broad project to try to get that information and to help both advanced reactor fuels, coal development, and it's touching many other aspects of what we do at the agency. And I, I think it's a great example of one of the innovative projects that we're, we're doing to try to move ahead. And as you can see, even the slides don't have the dense words and all the things that you normally see. So we're trying to demonstrate that across the entire project. Right. I would just add that um, in NMSS, we've been following both the ATF and Advanced Reactor program closely. Some of the same people that are involved in the ATF licensing actions are also involved in the um, preparing the agency for the Advanced Reactor. So I think I agree with um, Andrea's statements that we are closely working together towards what we learn in one program can be learned in the other one, and we're, we're in close communication with both programs. Okay, thank you. Um, Mike, you, um, and I guess Marilyn, if you jump in here, you, if you want to, but the uh, regulatory issue summary 201903 um, on pre application communication and scheduling um, was issued in November 2019. It's my understanding that the RIS contained a list of questions um, that address these, could voluntarily respond to within, uh, uh, what, 60 days or something. Um, I'm interested in maybe knowing a little bit more about the types of responses you got. Um, uh, and has the response been what the staff expected? Um, and how will these responses, I guess, better uh, prepare staff? Yeah, the, some of the questions were such as, what technologies do they intend to submit or tend to apply for? Um, what, you know, what topic reports are coming in the future? 
Um, the responses we have received have been very helpful to us when it comes to uh, scheduling out and when, the, when our resources will be needed and approximately the timelines um, going into, you know, into uh, license applications. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come over to Mr. Corson here. Um, very good presentation, too, by the way. Thank you. Um, you discussed, uh, and in the first panel, we, I'm, I refer to this one, I think, Mr., um, with Mr. Senna from Southern. Um, you discussed a lot of the good work that the staff's doing to improve the codes and uh, models for fuel analysis. Um, in the accident tolerant fuel project plan, it's noted that the staff has no indication that fuel vendors intend to rely on advanced modeling um, and simulation to support license amendments for near-term concepts. Um, can you give me a little bit more detail on the benefits, if any, for an applicant to utilize such models for license applications? Sure. So I will say the one area where the vendors have talked about potentially using advanced modeling and simulation is in reducing the number of experiments that they need to perform. So what I'll say the shortcoming of these advanced modeling and simulation tools, the atomistic scale or mesoscale models, is they're very hard to validate because it's hard to get a lot of the the information on you know basic properties that you need to validate these codes. So it's hard to rely on them to develop uh, a model that you're actually going to use. But it's very useful in identifying trends in the data. So you could see you know maybe at this weight percent of a dopant, you might expect this behavior, and you might expect it to be better than this other weight percent. So in that respect, I think advanced modeling and simulation could be very useful in sort of narrowing the window of experiments that you need to perform and really targeting those experiments to look at what is really important. You know, what do you really need to measure in order to help you validate your codes? So I would say, you know, none of the vendors are really talking about directly using advanced modeling and simulation in their license applications, but they are, I believe, doing some work to help them identify important experiments and important things to, to measure. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Diaz, I'm gonna come with you with the last, uh, last question I've got here, I think. Um, you mentioned that the staff doesn't uh, anticipate needing to uh, make any changes to parts 70, 71, or 72, um, but they may need to make some changes to guidance. Um, what types of changes to guidance are, uh, have you identified? And for the fuel designs that you expect to see the near term, near term, and what is your timeline maybe for implementing them? So right now we believe that part 70, 71, 72, we won't need any rulemaking or any guidance changes. Um, there has been some recent updates to the guidance for transportation um, and cladding materials that has recently been issued for high burn up. Um, so that's one we just issued and we believe that the guidance provided in that guidance and other guidance um, are going to be applicable for what we're expecting in the near term concepts of ATF. Um, I guess our understanding is that as we move forward with the research activities that we're conducting and we're planning to conduct, there's going to be in for the criticality um, literature review and there's some other research activities that will be for the cladding properties. Based on what comes out of those report and there'll, there'll be another PERT on that, based on what comes out of those report and PERT, we'll, we'll know more about what changes to our guidance will be needed. Uh, for the next step. Okay, thank you very much. And you're the only one from NMSS up here, so uh, you did a good job. Thanks. Well, I join my colleagues in thanking the staff and all of those who supported their presentations for a lot of uh, great updates and information today. Andrea, um, you had, uh, I think, made a comment that the way that the NRC is structuring itself to approach this work is akin to a kind of a matrix organization approach. 
Historically, NRC has made it somewhat cumbersome sometimes to assign individuals to work, and we were a little more stovepiped in the way we were approaching things. I've long been an advocate for kind of cross-functional, multidisciplinary teams, given the, the complexity of the type of work that we do. Should I draw from your statement, Andrea, that, that in your observation we're getting a little bit more agile as an organization to, to have this kind of a getting the capacity to the work no matter where people are assigned in the organization? Yes, I would make that conclusion because I've seen it in other areas as well. We are not encumbered by bureaucracy or hierarchy. If I need to read, you know, reach out to Mike, I reach out to Mike. I don't have to reach out to his division director or deputy or branch chief. So I've seen this model work well, particularly in this project, but I'm also seeing it in other projects as well. So I think the needle is moving. Thank you very much. That's encouraging. And I, I know when we saw that post Fukushima and we had some difficulty in getting staff on all the analysis and review work we had to do, um, I, I think we acknowledged the problem at that stage. So it's good to hear that we've moved uh, the needle away from, uh, from some of that, which is classic, you know, where you're kind of doing something to yourself. So it's, it's good that we've, we've worked on that. Um, can someone on the panel just briefly give an overview of how the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards is involved in this work and at what points? How is the staff structuring its engagement with the ACRS? Josh, please. Yeah. Um, so it depends on exactly. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> sorry. The, um, for the ISG, we had a subcommittee meeting. Uh, with the ACRS to go over that. That's part of the ISG process is going through the ACRS. We've also had um, additional ATF ACRS meeting, I think at least one, maybe two, where we've gone over the project plan. Um, and then for the near-term concepts that we expect submittals in the uh, in very near future, I think we're all anticipating that the ACRS would like to see those. And so we're kind of scheduling into our um, review time for that. Okay, thank you. And since you mentioned the project plan, um, I noted that um, when uh, you all became aware that the higher burn up and higher enrichment stuff was going to emerge maybe a little sooner than you thought, you did the Appendix A update to the project plan. Is that your conceptual approach going forward is maybe a series of appendices to the project plan, or do you consider the project plan the basic structure of your approach and you wouldn't really need to revise that or update it? Do you have any concept? Yeah, Michael. We look about every six months to update the project plan for current events. I mean, uh, and so yeah, if we do have if we have a need for a new appendix or update the project plan, we will go ahead and do it at the time. Okay, so both the plan itself, but you can also supplement it through uh, appendices. Yeah, Thank in, in the you. Last, yeah, in the last revision, we did a few revisions just for updating of act completion of activities. And if we need something larger, yeah, then we'll add a new appendix to it. Okay. On the previous panel, there was a description of perhaps some industry suggestion that the staff um, maybe confine its regulatory reach into the fuel manufacturing process parameters, and it was indicated by the panelists that the staff had not adopted that suggestion. I wasn't really following that, but it raises a, a kind of an interesting point. Could one of you talk very generally about the engagement in terms of the actual manufacturing process, you know, of this fuel? What kind of considerations, how active are you in terms of any maybe restrictions or limits or qualifications? Qualifications and things you want in that area, just at a very high level. I realize it could be very detailed. Yeah, so I'll try and be pretty brief. The current fuel um, relies on uh, ASTM standards for a lot of their testing, and so the NRC has the ability to go and inspect those processes, and they have something to inspect it against. Um, there was a comment on the ISG that requested that some language be added that the NRC would not, um, I guess, uh, regulate the manufacturing process. I, I, I forget the exact terminology. And it was based on the fact that in the PERT, there's some discussion um, about certain material properties where it might, you know, th there's some background on all those material properties in the list. And it says, you know, this material property may be particularly affected by the uh, coding application process. Um, and so I think there was some sensitivity that they don't want it, they didn't want us to go in and... Uh, kind of like design the actual application right. of a coding and what kind of nozzle would do it and things like they didn't want exactly. the, the specification to go there. And I, I think it's, it would have been premature for us to say, 
hands down, we're not going to ever look at that because it's, uh, the vendor needs to define what coding they want approved. And for the current process, you know, it's a zirconium alloy. Uh, they talk about the alloying elements and the different impurity levels that are allowed. And that's all stuff that can be inspected and can also be inspected against the ASTM standard. With something like the coatings where there is no standard, you know, it's up to them to define that. And if it, it turns out that they need to use a very specific nozzle to get this performance, and without that nozzle they get completely different performance, then they may need to use that in their topical report okay. as a way of defining that coating. I don't think that's going to be the case, but it didn't seem appropriate to remove that possibility. Um, at the ISG. Okay, that's very helpful. Dan, did you want yeah, to say just, something? Just just briefly at a, at a little bit higher level. So w w the commission regulates the fabricator of the fuel for the safety of the public around that facility and the workers at that facility. Separately, we regulate their customer, <laughs> the reactor, and and through the reactor's quality assurance plan, they regulate their vendors. Uh, and, and I think what Josh is touching on is the standards for what they're regulating on this safety-related component. Uh, we have clear standards for the existing fuel. There are not consensus standards for the next generation of fuel, and that's where this discussion is happening. Thank you. That, um, that's a very, I think, helpful uh, discussion and clarification about that. James, you talked about, uh, it was a very uh, interesting discussion about the confirmatory analysis tools, and you had a slide where I think you said, you know, the materials properties were kind of jumbled up inside. It was a gear, <laughs> and it was all kind of baked in there, and now we've, we have materials properties libraries and things, so you can do a more stylized kind of uh, confirmatory analysis. You also mentioned, though, the importance of, uh, you know, validation when you alter the, the machinery and that way, and you kind of say, well, you're going to draw these properties from a library instead of having them invoked in some other way within the model itself. Um, do we have at NRC, are we, are we documenting, though, the validation process when we go through that? Because I know often um, it's very helpful if, if analysts later, 10 or 15 years later, can, can have insights into how you validated that what you thought the model was analyzing, it was actually analyzing once you made this type of change. Can you talk a little bit about how we document that for the future? Sure. So I was talking about this in the context of our FAST code. And FAST is a combination of our older FRAPCON and FRAPTRAN codes. So FRAPCON and FRAPTRAN, this is where things were sort of jumbled together. And we have a validate, validation documents for both FRAPCON and FRAPTRAN. Uh, they're available on our our website for the, the FRAPCOM FRAPTRAN codes. So you can see the sorts of experiments that we're using to validate our codes for various models, integral data. We'll have that same sort of document when we release FAST uh, to the public, or not to the public, to our user group in the next month. So you'll see that same sort of validation, and you should see that the results haven't really changed after we've removed these material properties for the existing properties. Now when we start to add new materials, then we would need to do, we would need to essentially append uh, this assessment document to say it's also valid for these fuel types. So right now, uh, the, of course, the, the assessment document focuses primarily on UO2 Zerk up to a certain burn up. But I believe there will also be test cases for metallic fuels that are used in like advanced reactors. So you'll see, you know, how some of those things have been added to fast once we've, you know, updated the codes. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. That is, um, that's very helpful. Um, and with that, I will turn to Commissioner Barron. Great, thanks. Well, thank you all for your presentations. Uh, it sounds like industry is really heading in the direction uh, with ATF. Um, of higher uh, enrichment, higher burn up fuel. So I have some questions about that. Um, I know that the chairman noted that, you know, when you look at the project plan, there's actually an appendix just focused on that. I don't know if that means the appendix has taken over the entire plan at this point, but um, it sounds like maybe it, it has. Um, starting kind of at the beginning of the timeline, if we think about lead test assemblies, and I'm just going to ask these questions to the whole panel, and whoever wants to answer can jump in. Um, will lead test assemblies for accident tolerant fuels with higher burn up or enrichment beyond 5% uh, require NRC approval through license amendment requests? Um, so 
in general, it's uh, sort of continued on the licensee to go through their 5059 process and determine when a license amendment is needed uh, for any change in the reactor, not just uh, LTAs. But, um, you know, we provided the LTA guidance letter to help uh, make clear the agency's position on the use of 5059. So I, I don't want to say that there's, uh, you know, basically we wrote a letter that said, in the, you know, here's how you make the decision. So I don't want to make the decision myself. But I would say that personally it's, it would be difficult for me to fathom a insertion of a higher enrichment LTA that would meet the guidance and be allowed to be inserted without a license amendment. Okay. And it would require an exemption. In addition. To exceed the 5%, so, so they would need that prior approval. Okay. And then um, if we kind of move forward a little bit to batch loading and the regulatory framework for that, um, the staff's project plan uh, discusses how higher burn up and higher enrichment uh, ATF might not fit into some of the current regulatory requirements, including those for emergency core cooling systems, accident source term, criticality accidents, uh, and ALARA. There are others too. Um, with respect to in-reactor performance uh, and approval to batch load ATF with higher burnup and enrichment uh, in reactors, it sounds like changes to the regulations are probably going to be needed. Um, but it also, the project plan also talks about near-term applicants um, needing to request exemptions um, and demonstrate compliance with safety requirements. Um, and this, is, I guess, is a little bit of a follow-up to the, some of the questions that uh, Commissioner Caputo is asking, but I guess I'm struggling a little bit with what the right regulatory framework is for this. Do we want to have, um, do we want to go the rulemaking route and have an actual regula regulation uh, in place for ATF with higher burn up, higher uh, enrichment, or are we satisfied with an exemption approach, at least in the early years? Do folks have additional thoughts on that? I'll start at a general level, and then Josh may want to add some detail. For rulemaking, I would struggle with saying to what percent. Mm -hmm. It's it's the unknown unknowns. If you go down the path of rulemaking, you're assuming there's widespread adoption of ATF. So are you rulemaking to an absolute limit, 10, 20 percent, or are you rulemaking to 5.4 percent? So we would need to know more about adoption, potentially um, benefit fits or margins that applicants or licensees are going to ask for. And we are looking at this, this time frame. Right now, if we were to try to engage in rulemaking for, let's, let's say, for chromium coated, which is not needed at this point, it would be a bit like taking a hammer to, you know, to hit a gnat. We have the interim staff guidance, and we're prepared to license chromium coated. So the exemption was the more feasible and more durable way to handle handle chromium coated right now. But that's why we're assessing rulemaking because, as Commissioner Caputo pointed out, some of the more exotic, and the chairman also said some of the more exotic technologies, if we get an idea that there's apparent widespread adoption, then that may require rulemaking. Yeah, so I guess there's two places where um, exemptions may be needed in the near future. One would be for um, a, a different coding, there may be the need for 5046 exemptions. Um, but for the 5068 exemptions, I do think we, or for the 5068 rule, which limits uh, plants to loading uh, less than 5% enrichment into their spent fuel pools. Um, I think we do intend to, to regulate through an exemption at the beginning before um, determining whether there's going to be widespread adoption and it's worth the resources to invest in new rulemaking for that. I mean, does the, you know, it sounds like that the time frame involved is kind of slipping potentially from 2023 to more like 2025, and it sounds like there's a shift really from what I've been calling regular ATF to, you know, maybe exclusively high burn up, high enrichment. Does that affect the way you look at whether rulemaking makes sense? I mean, it potentially provides additional time, even if you didn't get all the way to final the documents that you're creating for that rulemaking process, which actually includes some public involvement exemptions, don't, you know, reg basis, proposed rule, those sta those documents would be presumably quite helpful to your technical reviews of of applications that were to come in, even if the rule weren't final by then. I mean, does that, does the kind of changing time frame and the changing nature of what's coming in, uh, how you... 
think about this issue? I, I would offer I think about it the other way. Okay. Um, the, so so the, the, the nearest term appears to be a chromium coated at some level of enrichment above 5%. Mm -hmm. um, and and through the through the lead test assembly data, through criticality benchmark data, through uh, all the data that will be gathered to provide a technical basis to support the exemptions needed to and place that fuel in a batch in a reactor uh, to to provide an, a, a, some alternative to 5046 for the ECCS performance criteria for that. We're going to learn a lot through that process uh, that would help us in forming the regulatory basis for a subsequent rulemaking. If we wait for the uh, for all the data uh, and get the regulatory basis and go through the rulemaking process, uh, we're not going to we're not going to get there in that time frame. Number one, I think. Num number two, I think that that uh, you know that then then we're deferring the licensing until after we get through a rulemaking process, and I don't think that's necessary for us to be able to reach safety conclusions about specific applications. Um, I wanted to ask uh, about an issue that um, uh, Commissioner Wright actually mentioned with the first panel, which is that um, the project plan suggested that NRC's existing license renewal generic environmental impact statement uh, might not adequately address the environmental impact of higher burn up, higher enrichment uh, ATF. Can someone walk through that issue in a little bit more detail? Right now, um, whenever we're developing the uh, licensing roadmap uh, when it comes to the generic environmental impact statement. Um, we're going to be reviewing what's going to be needed for high burn up and increased enrichment. And I know currently right now that the staff is reviewing, um, at least for license renewal, and are aware of ATF issues um, for the re for next revision to the to the guys. So is this, I mean, is this kind of an open question about for the purposes of licensing, you know, ATF in the near term? Whether is there an open question about whether a GEIS adequately covers this, or there's going to be additional environmental information that would need to be provided by an applicant? Um, right now, I think it's an open question. Okay, and and what is it going to take to answer that question? We have to see what people submit, or there's an analysis going on of the existing environmental impact statement and what it does or does not cover. I think is we're going to have to see what the licensees submit. And, and and it will need to look at okay the changes in the material properties and, and the associated impacts on effluents and inputs that would go into the environmental impact statement. Are they bounded by what's already in the guise, or uh, would there be some other environmental considerations that need to be addressed in that licensing process, whether it's through an EA or, 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 or a modification, From kind of a regulatory a certainty point of view, I guess our communication then is to a potential applicant, you yourselves are going to need to analyze whether or not what you have and, is bounded by the and we need to And we need to statement. continue in, in, in these uh, collaborations and, and the engagements with stakeholders as they develop the data from LTAs and from other sources to uh, understand that as well going forward. But. Okay. Right. Thank you. Anything further? No. Well, again, I want to uh, thank the